We are now live. Right, great. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, the attendees for our Zoom meeting are now populating in, um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our fifth uh, CAC meeting for the 2020 year. Uh, my name is Evan Zelig. I am the elected uh, CAC chair. Uh, Lorena Barrera is our CAC vice chair. Uh, we will be co-hosting uh, co and facilitating this presentation uh, for our CAC members and, and for uh, the community. Uh, thank you again for being here. As you can see, uh, there are a lot of panelists and we have a lot of attendees right now. Um, if anybody would like Spanish translation, which is available, please use the um, program to raise your hand. Si hay alguien que necesita traducir en español, por favor suba la mano. And if somebody is raising their hand, Adriana will give you some further instructions. I don't see anybody uh, presently raising their hand. Um, if somebody does in the uh, future, I'll we'll, uh, bring that back. Um, if uh, you do need Spanish translation, please select the globe at the bottom of your screen and select the Spanish language button. Uh, por favor, oprime el globo que está abajo en su pantalla. Escoja español y la traducción en perezada. I apologize if my Spanish is not uh, as good as it can be, but uh, hopefully for those needing it, um, they will uh, be able to participate. Um, Lorena, would you please um, talk to our uh, attendees about the CAC Design Team Alliance this evening? Of course. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me well? <clears throat> okay, perfect. Thank you all for joining us. So our Design Team Alliance is a list of norms which describe the way the Community Advisory Council wants to show up and be in community while moder modeling collaborative behavior. You request that CAC members, staff, special guests, and the public follow these norms, which are be tough on, on the topic, not on people, respect others, respect others' perspective, respect time, practice active listening, be open-minded, speak to others as you would like to be spoken to, honor freedom of speech, and call each other in. Uh, thank you very much, Lorena. Um, also, everybody you may refer to the agenda for our commitment to civil engagement as well. Uh, for tonight's meeting, I also wanted to address public comments to ensure that there is a shared understanding about public comment tonight. I do see uh, right now 95 attendees. There will be public comments after approximately every four present uh, presentations. Public comments will only be relating to the previous four presentations that you saw. So if you want to make public comment on the four presentations, please do so. After those, when we take the next four presentations, we'll only ask for public comment for those next four presentations. Uh, if there is more than 10 people wishing to make public comment at any one given time, we may adjust the time permitted to give public comment. We do want as many people to be able to speak as possible. Um, and additionally, there will be public comments at the end of the meeting for a regular public comments for matters that are within our subject matter jurisdiction, uh, but were not specifically discussed this evening. Um, I do want to uh, first introduce our new board member, uh, Jose Landaverde. He is representing the third district for Supervisor Shirley Zane. Um, so welcome, Jose. I believe he is uh, online here. I'm right over here, Evan. Oh, great. There he is. <laughs> uh, welcome, Jose. Thank you very much. Um, um, go on. I, I, I really had no intro prepared, uh, but it's just a pleasure to uh, serve uh, for the CAC. Thank you. Um, I also would like to announce that Maria Pacheco has resigned from the uh, Community Advisory Council. Uh, we do wish her well and thank her for her service. Thank you, Maria. Um, I don't know if she's uh, one of our attendees this evening, but thank you, Maria. 
<clears throat> Will the uh, CAC vice chair please lead us in the uh, CAC roll call, please? Okay, I'm gonna call out council members. Um, council member Laura's Bailey. Oh, sorry. Um, she is here. Council member Dora Barrera. Here. Um. Council member David Hernandez. Present. Council member Jose Landaverde. Present. Council member Alma Roman Diaz. Present. Vice Chair Lorena Barrera, that's me, and Chair Evan Zellig. Present, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to approve the uh, meeting minutes and the notes from our last meeting. Um, everybody should have received those on our CAC by email. Um, is there a motion by a CAC member to approve the minutes from our last meeting? So moved. And that second. was uh, Lorena? Yes. Lorena Bailey, second. Great. Thank you, Lorez. Okay, so now we do a roll call on that. Council member Lorez Bailey. Accept. Council member Dora Barrera. Accept. Council member David Hernandez. I also accept. Council member Jose Landa Verde. Accept. Um, I believe you have to abstain since you yeah. are not present. Um, Council member Alma Roman Diaz. Abstain. I was not I, present. Thank you. Vice Chair Barrera, I accept. And Chair Evan Zellig. I uh, accept the minutes. Thank you. And I'm just going to do another check. Uh, if anybody would like Spanish translation, please raise your hand on the uh, Zoom application. Si hay alguien que necesita traducción en español, por favor suba la mano. And I'm just going through, I don't see anybody who's raised their hand, but if we see that pop up, we will um, again uh, address that with a uh, translation. So I now wanted to uh, introduce our panel. This is going to be a little bit different uh, CAC meeting this evening. Uh, what we wanna do is introduce our panel. I'm gonna call each person by name. We do have a lot of panelists. When I call you, if you could please just introduce yourself with your name as well as the organization that you are here representing. And um, we'll get through those. Uh, first, I do want to introduce a few individuals who are here as panelists, uh, but not necessarily uh, speaking, unless they, of course, want to add to the conversation. Uh, they're not presenters, uh, but can certainly be a part of our conversation, and, and this is why they're here. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, Chair of the Board of Supervisors, Ms. Gorin. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be here uh, listening tonight, listening to what you have to say. Uh, Supervisor Hopkins. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here to listen as well. Uh, our Sheriff Mark Essick is present. Good evening. Thank you for having me uh, tonight. I look forward to listening to all the comments and input uh, that we're going to be discussing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, County Council of uh, Sonoma County, Bruce Goldstein. Is Mr. Goldstein present? Perhaps he will uh, join shortly. Uh, Bob Pittman is Assistant uh, County Council. Uh, Mr. Pittman. Good evening and thank you for having me. Uh, like the supervisors, I'm here to listen and uh, Great. appreciate it. Uh, we have Emily Asensio from Sonoma State University. Hi, happy to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's comments tonight. Delache Carmona Benson from the Santa Rosa Junior College um, Uplifting Black Leaders. Um, actually, I'm from, yes, Uplifting. I'm the Vice President of Uplifting Black Leaders, but I'm also a leader at BSU, which is Black Student Union at SRJC. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Christine Burke. 
Thank you, Evan. Happy to be here. I'm uh, representing the criminal defense community um, in Sonoma County. Uh, we have Jim Duffy. I am happy to be here. I'm with the uh, Evelyn Cheatham Committee. Uh, Karen Feese, and I, I apologize if I pronounce a, a name wrong. I apologize. Karen? Hi, Karen Feese is here. Thank you very much as well. Uh, Kathleen Finnegan? Yes, good evening, everyone. I am a, a founding member of the Police Brutality Coalition of Sonoma County. Thank you. Great. Uh, Diana Grant? Is Diana present? Yes. Can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Yes. Hi, I am representing Sonoma State University, although you just spoke with my colleague, Dr. Asensio, Emily Asensio, and my other colleague, Napoleon Reyes, is here. So we're SSU, Criminology and Criminal Justice Studies, working with the IO Network. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Handron? Hello, I'm here representing Vicki Handron. My name's Alondra Marroquin from Sonoma Immigrant Services. Thank you, Alondra. Um, Elias uh, Hinnett, I'm not sure, is Elias, uh, I saw that he was listed as an attendee. I'm not sure if he was able to make it over as a panelist, but uh, I believe Elias is, is present. Um, hopefully he'll be able to join us as a, um, a panel representative shortly. Uh, Maria Jasso uh, from Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Hi, Maria Hasso. Yes, with the Hispanic Chamber Young Professionals, and then also representing uh, my small business uh, here in Sonoma County. Thank you, Ms. Hasso. Uh, Sylvia Lemus. Yes, Sylvia Lemus. I'm here representing Los Cien, Sonoma County, and also I'm a founding member of the Community and Local Law Enforcement Task Force. Thank you. Uh, Malinali Lopez. Hello, everyone. I'm here uh, representing Sonoma State and also my business, um, XQL Media. We're a film production company. Uh, Ron Lopez, are you present as well? Ron, are you present with us today? Okay, we'll come back if uh, he's available. Is Alondra Meriquin available? Yes, it's me, um, representing Sonoma Immigrant Services. Thank you. Uh, Patty Morandi? <coughs> Is uh, Patty available? Uh, how about Amanda Negrete, please? Hi, I'm Amanda Negretti. I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm representing uh, Santa Rosa Junior College's Second Chance Club, and I'm an Administration of Justice major. Thank you. Uh, Richard Ortiz, I believe, also from Second Chance? Yes, I'm representing uh, Rhonda Findings. She's a coordinator for the Second Chance program. Great. Uh, Napoleon Reyes. Hello, good evening, everyone from Sonoma State. Um, happy to be here. And Faith Ross. Is Faith available? Faith, you need to unmute. There I you go. I just did. Sorry. I'm Faith Ross, representing Petaluma Blacks for Community Development. Thank you. Karim Sanchez. Karim Sanchez, community organizer with North Bay Organizing Project. Uh, L, he, him, his pronouns. Thank you. Uh, Ruben Scott. I'm Kimberly McNeil, and I'm here on behalf of the NAACP and Ruben Scott. Thank you, Kimberly. Is Lauren Servais here, or Servais? Lauren, are you around? Hi, Evan. Oh. It's Carlene. She's going to be an attendee tonight. Okay, thank you. 
uh, Kimberly Barbosa. Hi, actually, it's uh, Kimmy Barbosa Soero uh, with Love and Light. Thank you very much. Uh, Julio Torres. <coughs> I'm Julio Torres, representing Generation oh. oh. College at Second Chance Club. Anastasia Tusuni or Tausauni. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm having some uh, te technical difficulties. I'm representing Sonoma State University, Criminal Justice and Criminology Department. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Rafael Vasquez. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Toscano Contreras Saoris. I am representing Rafael Vasquez and Mecha de SRJC. I am also a student trustee at the SRJC and Student Government. And, and your first name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn, thank you. Ku Yang Vigil. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ku Yang Vigil, and I am representing Sonoma State University, the Educational Opportunity Program, and I'm also the Asian Pacific Islander American uh, co chair. Thank, thank you. you for having me. And uh, Martin Weil. Hi, I'm Martin Weil, uh, representing Sonoma Valley. And uh, last panelist, Jerry Tao. Are you with us, Jerry? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm Ron Lopez and I'm um, Representing Sonoma State University, I'm the chair of Chicano and Latino Studies. Although I'm gonna to have to step out of the meeting for a few minutes, but um, are, is this meeting being recorded? Um, I don't believe, oh yes, it is being recorded. It does say it's recorded. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, I have to go pick up one of my children, but I will be back. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Okay, so that is the list of our panelists today. And uh, what we want to do, um, again, we are doing this a little bit differently. We want to listen to our panelists. We're going to take um, three or four presenters at a time, uh, followed by discussion among the CAC, where we are going to ask questions of those presenters and discuss among the CAC members uh, the previous presentations. We'll then open it up uh, each time to public comments so we can listen to um, our community input based on those presenters. Um, we will start uh, the presentation tonight with our Iolero director. Uh, we're gonna hear from her first, followed by Jim Duffy, uh, who will give a presentation on the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance. Um, so Carlene, if we could please have uh, your presentation. Okay, thank you, Evan. Can everybody hear me? I put headphones on tonight because I was told there was trouble hearing my voice. It looks yeah. like you can hear me. So I'm gonna share my screen. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Iolero and the CAC invited all of you here tonight with the hope of creating an environment of inclusiveness where we can discuss law enforcement reform in Sonoma County together. I want to be clear from the outset, this forum is not about Iolero or the CAC trying to advocate in one direction or the other to amend Iolero's ordinance either through the Board of Supervisors or by putting it on the ballot. There are benefits and risks to each option and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. What is important is that the community be informed of the options and have an opportunity to discuss and understand them. Law enforcement reform is a community problem. It's a problem that has been plaguing communities of color in our country for hundreds of years. It's important to me and to the CAC that we create a space for the community and for people of color in particular to talk about the options and to give our input on the actual ordinance that will strengthen Iolero and law enforcement oversight in Sonoma County. This presentation that I'm gonna give incorporates a lot of information, but in the end, it all gets boiled down to seven questions that Iolero and the CAC are asking for your input on tonight. Are you getting feedback? 
Yes. Not anymore. Okay. I think if everyone mutes themselves, we should be able to avoid that. So I think first it's important for us to review our goals for law enforcement oversight. These are big picture goals of law enforcement reform and of Ioleros. The first one, first and foremost, is to prevent biased and excessive use of force by law enforcement. The second goal is to create more transparency and understanding of law enforcement operations. The third goal is to improve trust between the community and law enforcement. And the fourth goal is to make public safety a partnership between the community and our law enforcement. Strengthening Iolero, I'm sorry, strengthening law enforcement oversight in Sonoma County requires amending Iolero's ordinance in order to give Iolero more power. These are the four current options for amending Iolero's ordinance. I'm going to review them and then we'll go over the benefits and risks of each one. And we wanna know what you think. Option A is that the Board of Supervisors can amend Iolero's ordinance directly in a manner that they choose. Option B is that the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance can be placed on the November 2020 ballot, unmodified. That means the voters would decide whether to amend Iolero's ordinance. Option C, is that we use the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance as a base. We make modifications to it and we place it on the November 2020 ballot. And again, the voters would choose whether to amend Iolero's ordinance. And option D is to use the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance as a base, make modifications to it, and ask the Board of Supervisors to adopt it in whole. There are benefits and risks to option A, which is the Board of Supervisors Amendment. This is what was initially proposed at the Board of Supervisors meeting on July 14th. These are big picture benefits and risks intended to start our conversation tonight. This is not intended to be an exhaustive list of the benefits and risks about this option or any other part of this process. The first benefit to a Board of Supervisors Amendment is that it allows for a listening tour. That means input from me, the director, from the Evelyn Cheatham Committee, and from the community, which is why you're here tonight. Benefit two is that it allows for a focus on communities of color to give us your input, your feedback, and your suggestions directly in a room like this about the ordinance itself. Benefit three is that it allows for the addition of powers that are currently missing from the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. The risks are first, that it'll be up to the Board of Supervisors to implement the changes the community desires. And all the changes in the final draft have to be approved by a three-fifths vote. Risk number two is that the amendments can be taken away or watered down in the future by a future Board of Supervisors. And this is something that a lot of people are concerned about and that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Risk number three is that the listening tour and the process will take time and it would be ideal to make these changes as soon as possible. Option B is to place the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance on the ballot unmodified. The benefits to this option are first, that the voters would decide whether to amend Iolero's ordinance. Benefit two is that the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance is a good start. It includes many positive ideas for strengthening Iolero. But there are risks and the first one is that there's no guarantee that the voters will pass the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance. We need a 50% plus one vote, and if it isn't passed, no changes will be made to Iolero. It's really important to understand what this means. We would, all, we would need half of all the people who vote plus one for the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance to pass. So for example, if 100,000 people voted, half the voters would be 50,000 voters. So we would need 50,000 and one people to vote for the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance in order for it to become law. If half the voters plus one do not vote for the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, the changes will not happen to strengthen Iolero. If it doesn't pass, the question becomes whether the Board of Supervisors will still make changes to Iolero's ordinance, or if they'll say, well, the voters have spoken and we're not gonna make these changes to Iolero after the voters, our constituents, told us that they don't wanna make the changes. Risk number two to this option is that while the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance is a good start, it's missing some key provisions that are needed to strengthen Iolero. And I'm gonna talk about some of those in a minute. 
And risk number three is cost. This is an issue that has come up with the Board of Supervisors. It would cost approximately $250,000 to put a measure on the ballot. I think this is a reasonable question for the supervisors to ask because it's their job to oversee our county and that includes the budget. However, there's also a cost to not strengthening law enforcement oversight in Sonoma County. We pay substantial costs in civil litigation and settlements and also insurance premiums based on law enforcement's use of force, injuries, and officer-involved deaths. So I wanted to bring this up because it's a part of the conversation and it's important, but I'm not gonna focus on it in this presentation tonight because while I think that it's important to acknowledge that there are costs associated with putting the measure on the ballot, it also costs our county a lot not to improve law enforcement oversight. This is a complex issue that's beyond the focus of our conversation here tonight. These are some examples of provisions that were not included in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. In the previous slide, I mentioned that one of the risks to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance is that it's a good start, but it's not as comprehensive as it could be, and it has some loopholes that need to be cleaned up. There are five suggestions that I made that are missing from the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. Recently, in an open letter that was published to the Board of Supervisors, it was argued that some of my suggestions are already included in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. I disagree. I'm going to review each of them in the next five slides to explain why I disagree and to give you the information so that the CAC and the members of the community who are here tonight can advise us on which changes, if any, you'd like to see incorporated into the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and Iowero's Ordinance. This is one of the recommendations that I made. That Iowero shall receive every case for audit where a civil lawsuit is filed against the sheriff's office related to the use of force, regardless of whether a complaint is filed with Iolero or the sheriff's office. Currently, Iolero only receives use of force cases for audit if a complaint is made or if the sheriff's office opens up an investigation on their own. In the open letter to the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Threed argued that this recommendation is already covered under the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance in the section he called matters of significant public interest. I've read the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance many times and I did several word searches on the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and there actually is no provision that talks of significant public interest. However, there is a section that requires review of incidents that become a matter of media interest and you can see the language on the right side of the screen there with the citation from the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. What you should know is that while sometimes civil lawsuits do become a matter of media interest, that is not always the case. So for example, I just recently audited a case where a community member got injuries during an arrest with the sheriff's office and he sued and there's a civil lawsuit pending. The media has never covered that case. So I think it's really important that we use clear and specific language to avoid loopholes that would keep important cases out of Iolero's review. This recommendation would not replace the media interest provision, but I think it should be added. The second example of a recommendation that I made that's not included in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance is that the ILRO receive all prior complaints for the involved deputy, prior investigations, including Brady investigations, and the record of discipline with each complaint for audit. Currently, when a complaint is made against a deputy, Iolero is not legally authorized to receive prior complaints or Brady investigations about the deputy with the audit. Brady evidence is evidence that often involves dishonesty of a witness, including police officers, when they testify in a criminal case. So for example, if an officer is found to have lied in court, he may be placed on what is known as the Brady list so that defendants in the future are warned about his history of dishonesty. In the open letter to the Board of Supervisors, arguing that some of my suggestions were already included in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance, it was argued that this recommendation also fell under the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance's provision about media interest. Again, this is not correct, and I'll give you an example. You may remember a case that occurred on November 27, 2019, when David Ward was killed during an arrest in Bloomfield near Petaluma. Charles Blount was the deputy who attempted to put Mr. Ward in a carotid hold by wrapping his arm around his neck. 
Back in 2015, there was a court case where Charles Blount was said to have used excessive force and put a woman in a similar neck hold. The Sheriff's Office did an investigation of the incident. However, it didn't get picked up by the media until 2019, after Mr. Ward was killed. In 2019, the newspaper reported that there were other excessive force complaints against Blount in 2011, in 2015, again in 2015, and in 2016. The point is that each case should be coming to Iolero for an audit with the full history of the prior incident, even if it's never been reported on in the newspaper. Again, it is important to use specific language so that Iolero is sure to receive this type of complaint and this type of information in every single case, regardless of whether it's rep reported in the newspaper, the news, or otherwise in the media. This recommendation should be added to Iolero's ordinance. It would not necessarily have to replace the provision about media interviews. Another recommendation I made for Iolero's ordinance is that Iolero receive for audit every incident of force used by a sheriff's deputy, regardless of whether the complaint is filed with Iolero or the sheriff's office. Currently, Iolero only receives use of force cases for audit if a complaint is made or if the sheriff's office opens their own investigation. Again, in the open letter to the Board of Supervisors from the Evelyn Cheatham Committee, it was argued that this provision is already included in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. However, as you can see on the screen, there's a difference between requiring every incident of force, as I suggested, and requiring incidents that only involve issues of whether force violate law and policy. So I'll give you an example. The Sheriff's Office actually has a policy that requires every single incident of force to be reviewed by the Sheriff's Office as a matter of course. So the deputies are required to document all instances when they use force. The Sheriff's Office tells us that every one of those reports is reviewed by a sergeant and a lieutenant. In the opinion of the Sheriff's Office, there is not always an issue of whether the force violates law or policy. Often it's just a part of the deputy's contact during an arrest and it's found to be within policy by the sergeant and the lieutenant and they move on. The language in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance creates a loophole where instances of force will not be turned over to Iowaro if it's not seen by the Sheriff's Office as an issue of whether the force violates law or policy. I think the language from my recommendation should replace this provision in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. However, Mr. Duffy is presenting after me today, and there may be a reason why um, they should both be included. So you'll hear from him, and you'll have all the information before you, before you come to any conclusions. The next recommendation I made was that Iolero have direct access to all body-worn camera videos. They're known as BWCs and be authorized to post every body-worn camera video where force was used on Iolero's website in the interest of transparency. Currently, Iolero does not have direct access to body-worn camera vi video evidence and must request the BWCs from the Sheriff's Office. Iolero is therefore unaware if there are any BWCs that were not provided to Iolero. Iolero does not currently have the legal authority to publicly release the BWC evidence. It has been suggested that this recommendation is already covered by the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance in the section that requires, quote, direct unfettered access to all information of the Sheriff's Office. You can see the language on the right side of the slide with the citation to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. There's a major difference between my recommendation and what is in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. First, it is correct that body-worn cameras would likely fall under this provision as information of the Sheriff's Office. However, Mr. Threep believes that the second part of my recommendation, allowing for Iolero to post the videos, is prohibited by state law. I disagree, and before I tell you why, I want to say this. There are a lot of legal questions involved in amending Iolero's ordinance. Many of the provisions, including the provisions in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance, do not have clear legal answers as to whether they are lawful or whether they will hold up in court. You should know that when Iolero's ordinance is amended, it will very likely end up in court. That is not something that should detour us from seeking these changes. 
It will likely go to court and whether the changes are made at the ballot or they're made at the Board of Supervisors, the courts will decide what is lawful and unlawful. I don't see any value in haggling over the legal authority or vulnerability of the changes with each other. If and when this goes to court, our opponents will argue about what parts are legally vulnerable. When we point out the legal vulnerabilities in each other's arguments, it only serves to be divisive and to weaken our collective desire for change. That being said, it was argued in the public letter that this section is legally vulnerable, so I'm going to address it very briefly. Penal Code Section 832.7 currently provides an exception for investigations or proceedings concerning the conduct of peace officers and custodial officers. I think there's a strong argument that Iolero's audits fall under this exception and would allow for Iolero to post the videos publicly. However, I want to point out that this recommendation is not something Iolero currently has the staffing to manage. In 2019, the Sheriff's Office reports that there were approximately 245 cases where force was used. That was out of 4,832 arrests, which means that approximately 5% of arrests resulted in the use of force. Currently, I am the only one authorized to audit these kinds of cases from the Sheriff's Office in Sonoma County. 245 body-worn cameras involving force on top of all of the complaints and the other work that I have to do as the department head is more than I can handle alone. I'm hoping that if the Board of Supervisors expands Iolero's powers, we will receive additional staff to help handle all of the additional work that comes with expanding the powers. Once I have a better idea of how much additional staffing Iolero will have, I'll be able to determine whether we could actually review every instance of force or if we'd have to implement a random sample type of review. This is the last recommendation I'm going to discuss tonight. And I just want to be clear that these weren't the only issues that I saw in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance, but because this may be our last meeting tonight, depending on what decisions are made, I had to pare it down to the most important changes and options to talk about. This recommendation is that Iolero be authorized to make discipline recommendations for the officers being investigated. Currently, Iolero is not legally authorized to make discipline recommendations, and Iolero is not legally authorized to learn what discipline was imposed if a sheriff's deputy violated policy. So when a case comes to me, if the sheriff's office sustained the complaint and already found that the officer violated policy, I do not get information about what discipline was taken. This recommendation was not included at all in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance, and I don't believe there's been any arguments to the contrary. I think it would be helpful to try to narrow down our options. Based on what we just reviewed, I think the risks of options A and B weigh in favor of eliminating those two options and focusing on C and D. However, you are here tonight to discuss what you would like to see and what ultimate decision you would like it should be your decision. This is a community issue. The CAC is going to send a letter to the Board of Supervisors tonight summarizing what they heard you say that you want in an ordinance and how it gets implemented, whether that be ballot or Board of Supervisors. For option A, the idea of a listing tour with a focus on communities of color is very attractive. However, no matter what is heard and what we recommend, it would be left to the Board of Supervisors to decide what provisions will be included in Iolero's ordinance, and three out of five of them have to vote to pass that ordinance. And again, the changes can be taken away or watered down in the future by a future Board of Supervisors if it were decided, say, in five or ten years, that a future Board of Supervisors wanted to backtrack on law enforcement reform. For option B, while the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance is a good start, it's missing some really important provisions, and we just reviewed five of them here. If we want to actually strengthen Iolero's ordinance, we have to close those loopholes. There's a lot of value in a ballot initiative that allows voters to decide whether to amend Iolero's ordinance. For example, an ordinance amended by ballot can only be changed by ballot in the future. So the Board of Supervisors would not be able to take away the improvements or water them down. On the other hand, if there are provisions that end up not working, which happens a lot with new laws, we may only fix them by ballot. And as you know, and you've all seen, 
it can be really difficult to get onto the ballot. Also, as I said earlier, we need a 50% plus one vote, and we have to acknowledge that we may not win at the ballot. Right now feels like a favorable political environment for law enforcement reform. But if Iowa's ordinance goes onto the ballot, we should be ready for a well-funded anti-campaign launched by our opponents. If they launch an anti-campaign focusing on how much it'll cost to make these changes to Iolero, including the $250,000 it costs to put on the ballot and all of the additional staff I need to actually get this work done, I think that a community on the brink of a recession may not vote to pass the ordinance at the ballot at the poll. The Press Democrat published an article in this past Sunday's paper about North Bay business leaders openly calling on elected officials to stop putting tax measures on the November ballot. The article said that it's, quote, the worst economic time we've ever faced, and it feels like government is piling on, just asking for more money. You may also remember that it took just one person. It was one person who heavily funded the anti-smart tax campaign earlier this year. And despite the smart tax being supported by a majority of our elected officials, it failed miserably at the polls. You don't have to look far for evidence that not everyone supports law enforcement reform in Sonoma County. People are still out there saying all lives matter. People are still out there tearing down Black Lives Matter signs. If our opponents fund a well-funded anti-campaign at the time like this, when we're on the brink of a recession, we have to acknowledge and talk about the fact that we may not get the votes that we need. That being said, there are risks and benefits to both options. It's important that you be informed and take this opportunity to discuss and understand your options. This is your community decision. If the community understands the risks and chooses to put the ordinance on the ballot, I support that decision. If the community decides it wants certain guaranteed amendments from the Board of Supervisors without the uncertainty of an election, then I support that decision too. Either way, you should make sure that the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance is modified to add, to add the important provisions that it is currently missing. And you should use your voice to let us know what other suggestions you would like to see included in our ordinance. Which pathway is more likely to get us the results we want? That's the question. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of putting the ordinance on the ballot versus the Board of Supervisors making the changes. On the left is the option of making modifications to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and putting it on the ballot. The first benefit is that it expedites the process by using the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance as a base. The second benefit is that it allows for the addition of important provisions that are currently missing from the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. The third benefit is that it allows for input from the community with a focus on communities of color who are impacted most by police violence and conflict. You see, I put a star there. Unfortunately, tomorrow's the last day for the supervisors to make a decision about the ballot. So tonight would be it for a gathering of the community if our decision is that we want this to go to the the risk to making modifications and putting it on the ballot is that there's no guarantee the voters will pass the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance. And if it's not passed, we don't know if any changes will get made to Iowa. On the right is the option of making modifications to the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance and asking the Board of Supervisors to adopt it. Number one benefit is that it expedites the process by using the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance as a base. The second benefit is that it allows for the addition of important provisions that are currently missing from the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. The third benefit is that it allows for input from the community with a focus on communities of color. So if we went with this option, my hope would be that the CAC would hold a series of more forums like this one where community leaders could come together again and talk about the rest of the ordinance in small chunks and what we like and what we'd like to add and what we'd like to tweak. The risk to this option is that the supervisors have to agree, three out of five of them have to vote to pass it, and it can be watered down and changed in the future by a future Board of Supervisors, which is a concern I've heard a lot of since we've been talking about this. So like I said, I think it all boils down to seven questions. I'm going to read them really quickly because 
as we start the discussion, Evan and Lorena are gonna go through them in more detail. The first question is, do you wanna recommend that the Board of Supervisors modify the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and put it on the November 2020 ballot? Or that the Board of Supervisors modify the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and adopt it themselves? The second question is, do you wanna add a provision to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance that I will receive every case for audit where a civil lawsuit is filed against the Sheriff's Office? And three, do you wanna add a provision to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance that I will receive all prior complaints for the deputy, prior investigations, including Brady, and the record of discipline with each file? Four, do you wanna add a provision that I will receive for audit every incident of force used by a Sheriff's deputy, regardless of whether a complaint is filed? Five, do you wanna add a provision that Iolero has direct access to all body-worn cameras and be authorized to post them where force was used on Iolero's website in the interest of transparency? And six, do you wanna add a provision that Iolero be authorized to make discipline recommendations for the officers being investigated? Seven, and one of the most important questions for tonight is what ordinance suggestions do you have? I've heard some good ones already from some of our CAC members about including racial profiling data and whistleblower provisions. I've heard some other suggestions by other community members, and I'd like to hear more from you tonight. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Evan. Thank you very much, Carlene. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so we're definitely going to get to those seven questions at the end of all of our presentation um, when we discuss it more fully with the CAC. Uh, but for now, I'd like to open up to our CAC members if there are any questions for Carlene um, about her specific presentation, any uh, additional information that anybody wants uh, before we move on to our next presenter. Um, if there's anybody from the CAC who would like to ask Carlene anything, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and, and please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm not hearing any questions. Uh, I am going to, of course, we'll open it up to questions um, more beyond this. Uh, again, if anybody from the CAC has questions, please uh, let us know. Um, now I want to turn this over to Jim Duffy. Uh, Mr. Duffy is here for uh, presenting regarding the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance uh, to provide us with more information about the ordinance and, and what it provides. Uh, Mr. Duffy, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to apologize for a lack of formal greetings. I'm on a tight timeline and I'm told I need to keep this to under 10 minutes or I will be cut off. Thank so you. I'm going to Jim, I'm I'm not able to hear you. you. Are you Excuse me? I'm not able to hear you. Are you speaking presently? Yes. Hold oh, on. I can hear you again. Thank you. I can hear you again. Thank you. Oh. I'm hoping you add some time back for me now. Go ahead, Jim. Judas. Um, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. I'm sorry, folks. I just have to go back. I'm glad you can hear me now. I'm sorry. Okay. Damn it. All right, Evelyn Cheaton Ordinance. Community and local law enforcement task force took 16 months of almost weekly meetings uh, and they recommended the creation of the Iolero office. They recommended it start with four staff. The county administrator's office recommended that they staff the Iolero for the first year to get it set up, but the public didn't want that. So the supervisors agreed, but only hired two staff to start off. 
this uh, the founding director coming in and having to uh, start off creating an ordinance without any real experience in oversight. So we created a placeholder ordinance. So we always knew we were going to have to rewrite it. In December 2018, after uh, three years in the office, the new director recommended that the ordinance be rewritten. Uh, supervisors didn't take any action, so the committee began the process of rewriting the ordinance. Uh, who's the Evelyn Cheatham Committee? It's the Cole Organization. The audio. We can't hear you, Jim. Director Jerry Threat, and then some other community members who had been involved in law enforcement oversight through Iolero, uh, mostly through the Use of Force Community Working Group and the David Ward tragedy. Uh, two sets of metrics were used to develop the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. They were the deficiencies identified by the director in the December 2018 annual. Jim, it looks like we lost your audio. Jim, can you hear me? It looks like uh, we can't hear December you. December of 2018 uh, held as part of their meeting a uh, reform discussion that went for 30 minutes. And uh, this was a well attended meeting because we were also working on use of force at the time. And then in January of 2019, the Community Advisory Council again held another 45 minutes of discussion with the public on the reform discussion of what, what did the public want to see in a new ordinance for Iolero. And so uh, we're looking at the ordinance deficiencies that were identified now by the director in the annual report. Uh, there's an institutional imbalance. Uh, there's insufficient resources and funding for Iolero. And uh, there is how CAC members are appointed. And the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance addresses all of these deficiencies in the sections that are identified here. Uh, going on to the NACOL 13 core elements for effective oversight, there is independence, adequate jurisdictional authority, and unfettered access to records. All three of these are addressed in the uh, Evelyn Sheetham Ordinance. The next four, four to six of the core elements of NACOL, there's uh, access to law enforcement executives and Jim, we've lost your uh, audio again. I don't know if you can hear me, but we've lost your audio again. which would be the Board of Supervisors. And uh, that's a really important change, getting this. Hey, Jim, I don't know if you can hear me, Mr. Duffy. Um, we Pattern we analysis. Jim, I don't know if you can hear me, but we keep losing your audio intermittently. Uh, we didn't hear the last 30 seconds of what you said. Okay, thank you, Evan. I'll go back. Thanks. So um, this really shows, I'm just going through the 13 core elements of I, uh, NACOL and showing where they are addressed in the Evelyn Sheetham Ordinance because these were new since we've had an, an ordinance drafted. Uh, NACOL just came out with these in 2015, and they're going to be coming out with an updated report soon. And so this shows everything that's needed, access to law enforcement executives, full cooperation, support of stakeholders. And we're really just looking at best practices here for over.
Jim, we keep losing your audio. I'm not sure if you can see. Pattern analysis. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? We've, we've lost you on audio again. I'm sorry. And one of the changes recommended, in fact, in the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance is that the director become certified Hey, um, Jim, Jim, just so you're aware, your, your audio is going in and out intermittently. Um, I'm not sure if it's an issue on your side, but, but we are hearing in and out. Okay, I am so sorry. I, I don't have uh, any other way of doing it than this. That's fine. We're, we're still reading the slides and perhaps um, you can make the slides uh, available afterwards for people who would like to uh, read them independently as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I will. So the summary of improvements made by the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, this is a really important page. It mandates the mutual collaboration with the sheriff's office. Right now, the sheriff is not required to cooperate with Iolero. This would require the sheriff to do so. It mandates that Iolero have access to the sheriff's investigation, incident reports, evidence, dispatch records, and databases. It establishes the clear authority of Iolero to conduct independent audits and investigations. It authorizes independent subpoena power for Iolero it establishes the ILR legal authority over investigations into use of force, constitutional violations, sexual assault or harassment, and allegations of bias in policing or incarceration. And it authorizes an adequate budget of 1% of the sheriff's budget, or the equivalent of 1%, allowing for adequate staffing of ILRO. This money does not come out of the sheriff's budget. Just want to be clear about that. It also authorizes a three-year term for the ILRO director who can only be removed for cause by a four-fifths vote of the Board of Supervisors. Now, there was some question about the legality of the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. And so uh, we got the ACLU to write a letter, and boy, I hope you can hear this part. Uh, their letter says, quote, the Evelyn Cheatham Effective Iolero Ordinance, as drafted, aligns with the law and constitution of this state. So now even if certain aspects are uh, thrown out in the courts, the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance has a savings clause that's also sometimes referred to as a severability clause, saying that if any section or subsection or sentence or phrase of the ordinance is held to be unconstitutional, that the rest of the ordinance remains in effect. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, the Sheriff's Office has used the annual reports as an opportunity twice to call for the defunding of Iolero. And it's gonna happen again. It needs to be put in by a vote of the people. And if we change the language on it, we're gonna lose the endorsements that we have. Uh, Organizational endorsements take a long time and getting them is uh, unlikely if we change and go to the ballot. And we need to go to the ballot to lock it in as an entity that can't be challenged. So this is just a list of all the endorsements. Um, in addition to all the endorsements, while we like our endorsers, we love our donors. We have over a hundred unique donors to the campaign. Uh, there was no polling before we went, 
to gather signatures because it's a grassroots effort and we needed to actually take out loans to print the petitions. And thanks to our 100 unique donors who have reached into their pockets, we've paid back all our loans. And uh, thank you, and sorry for my audio. Thank you, Jim, I uh, appreciate that. Um, again, uh, for Mr. Duffy and regarding the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, um, obviously we're going to discuss more at length at the end of all our presenters, but are there any uh, CAC members presently who have questions uh, for Mr. Duffy regarding uh, either specific provisions of the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance or anything else from his presentation that you want to address at this time? Um, anything from any of our CAC members? Um, I just had a question about the term for the director. Um, why did you uh, agree to have it, or where did the recommendation come from to have a set term for the director when it isn't something that's in the ordinance that we have right now, which I know um, is supposed to change, but uh, why three years only? And what would happen after those three years? We just change directors or? No, no, it's, it's a three-year contract at, that is renewable. And it's actually a, a NACOL, National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, best practice. And it's actually for the protection of the director so that the director is not subject to basically harassment by the sheriff and the supervisors if they take a position that is unpopular with the sheriff. And uh, so it, it guarantees that unless the direct, you know, once you hire a director, you don't get to get rid of her unless she really screws up. It has to be for cause that she has to be released and it takes a four fifths vote and it gives her more power in office to actually do strong oversight. Did that come through? Yes, it did. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lorena. Uh, does anybody else on our CAC have uh, further questions uh, at this time for Mr. Duffy? Okay, thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to turn next uh, to Karen Fees with, um, Karen, are you available right now? Yes, I am. Um, if you would like to go ahead and give your presentation, please. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Karen Fees and I'm the director for Sonoma County Human Services. First, I'd like to thank Director Navarro and the CAC for setting this community forum up. Appreciate you inviting so many community groups, especially so many community groups of color. As a Sonoma County resident, a woman of color myself, and someone who provides services to tens of thousands of low income and people of color in Sonoma County, I appreciate what you're doing tonight. The concept of police misconduct and excessive force is not a new one. People of color, especially low-income individuals, have been victims of this kind of violence and trauma, and it imprints on our families for generations. I've worked for Human Services for almost 35 years, and I've seen generational trauma and poverty. Recently in the U.S. and here in Sonoma County, there have been a movement to do something about excessive force. That's why we're here tonight. We cannot strengthen ILRO's ordinance or institute any kind of police reform for that matter if we don't create a space for people of color to give their viewpoint, suggestions, and opinions. We must listen and incorporate the feelings and ideas of communities of colors into the conversation and into ILRO's ordinance. There is no one correct way to strengthen ILRO's ordinance. The idea of putting the ordinance on the ballot is very attractive because it gives the matter to the voters over my personal uh, experience, voters don't tend to educate themselves oftentimes on some of the issues before they vote. We wanna make sure that people of color in the community have the opportunity to give their insight and their opinions into the ordinance itself. Representatives from our communities of color have shown up here tonight to give their input. They wanna be heard and have a role in strengthening police oversight in Sonoma County. We must all listen before deciding how the ordinance should look. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. Um, anybody on our CAC wish to uh, ask Karen any questions um, or speak uh, about her presentation at all? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to 
go through this. It's not necessarily in any order here, but uh, Christine Burke, I'm going to call you next uh, in order if you're uh, available. I'm available. Thank you, Evan. Great. So my name is Christine Burke. I've spent my legal career advocating for people accused of crimes. Um, I'm here on behalf of the criminal defense community. But before I went to law school, I also worked on political campaigns and studied under grassroots organizers, um, including Marshall Gans. So my adult career in politics and law has been about fighting for the cause of the underdog. I'm currently uh, the administrator of the Conflict Council Program, and I was previously a chief, of, uh, chief deputy at the Public Defender's Office. So I've heard the presentations today, and I want to hear more people's comments. And these thoughts are, you know, I'd like to say are not tentative, but I, I want to continue to listen. So the fact that I'm going first uh, doesn't mean I won't listen to what other people have to say. But here are some of the thoughts that I have about law enforcement accountability. Uh, it seems to me that our community is at a legal and political crossroads. Uh, this moment presents an opportunity to bend the arc toward justice, and um, much work has gone into drafting the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance um, and getting community members to sign on and endorse it. COVID-19 has complicated the landscape of uh, organizing and getting it on the ballot, um, but I see that there is a silver lining to that challenge. Here we all are in a Zoom meeting that most of us maybe wouldn't have participated in uh, before. So we're able to do it from our living rooms and bedrooms and, you know, in between uh, making dinner and <laughs> helping our, you know, kids get ready for bed. So I think that is part of the silver lining. But it also gives us a chance to include people's voices who we might not have been hearing from. And so um, it also coincided because Evelyn Cheatham um, didn't automatically, didn't qualify for the ballot. We also have had an, um, I'm not going to call it an uprising, but an awareness, an explosion of community awareness of police brutality. And there are people who, on this meeting who've been working on that cause for many, many years. And there are other people who've been on the receiving end um, of some mistakes and overreach by law enforcement. So those voices are all important to be heard. So at this critical juncture, the question is, what approach is best? Should we modify or should the board or someone modify the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance or accept it as it is? And then the second is, uh, should the board of supervisors adopt it or should it be put on the ballot for a direct vote? And while I under the board adopt concern is then it's not like what well, it seems pretty clear that um, it would give a good running start to a program that's improved. So here are my thoughts uh, about that. Are there benefits of making no changes to Evelyn Cheatham? Another way of asking that question is, is it perfect or can it be improved? It shouldn't matter where the idea comes from. What should matter is whether it's a good idea. What should matter is whether the proposed policy helps achieve the goals that we all seek. Um, there are a lot of times when our community is deeply divided, and it seems to me at this point there is a sizable majority of people in our community that believe in the goal of eliminating the use of excessive force. This isn't a measure that's about defunding the police. This is a measure about um, giving transparency and of it. So my computer is popping up screens and I'm, I'm trying to shut them down before I finish talking. So do the changes proposed by the community and by the director improve the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance or not? I believe they do. I think it clarifies issues. I think it makes it um, less, uh, it, it creates less opportunity for wiggle room. And then the last issue is, should the board uh, adopt it or should we put it on the ballot? And what I would say about that is, ballot is words 
the reason we have direct democracy in the sense of ballot initiatives and propositions is because there were times when voters found themselves extremely frustrated that elected leaders lead and wouldn't enact policies that should have. going back to Prop 13 and right, we can all name a good proposition or a bad proposition. And some of them that were really good failed, including uh, like eliminating the death penalty. So then the question is, what are the risks of going on, putting it on the ballot? And I think there is always a problem of proposition fatigue. This group it would be well informed, but your average voter, especially right now in a time of pandemic, recession, unemployment, distance learning with children, they have so much on their plate. I would be concerned that people would just go down the road and vote no. And terrible, that would be a terrible uh, outcome because then we'd be back at square one. It seems to me that Sonoma County's elected leaders have the information and the authority to improve ILRO, and I believe they should do so. Bringing a ballot measure, um, I think we can take the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, tighten up the language, improve uh, on it. It's a very good start. But I believe that right now, if um, elected leaders were to essentially uh, just put it on the ballot, that's kind of like kicking the can down the road or uh, passing the buck. I think our leaders can see what our LRO needs. I think they can see the ways it can be clarified and improved as the responsibility and the information and the authority to tighten up and improve ILRO. So for those reasons, I'm in favor of um, modifying the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, using it as a base, improving it, not, not watering it down, but, but clarifying it and improving it. And the Board of Supervisors, it would be my hope um, for those reasons, based on my experience and perspective, that adopting it. If it's on the ballot, I will support it and I will campaign for it. Um, but uh, for those reasons, I think that is the wisest strategy. Thank you, Christine. Um, based on those comments, does any member of our CAC have either uh, questions or comments, uh, anything regarding Christine's presentation? Okay, then um, what I'd like to do, thank you again, Christine. Uh, what I'd like to do then is um, open up this part for some public comment. Again, the public comment that we are going to take now is only related to the previous uh, presentations from the Iolero director, Jim Duffy, um, Karen Feast, and Christine Burke. So if you do have a public comment, please um, raise your hand on the app. We will go through and call people once you are unmuted, you may uh, give your public comment, which we are limiting to two minutes this evening. Um, and then uh, please, uh, you will be remuted. So we're going to go through. I do see we have quite a few hands raised. Uh, I'm going to just start an order uh, for Armando. No last name listed, Armando. Armando, are you there? Uh, Armando, you're muted. Let me, uh... okay, go ahead, Armando. Armando, if you would unmute yourself, uh, you can go ahead and speak. Oh, is that, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, at first, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Director Navarro for taking the opportunity to open up the space for people of color like myself. Um, it seems like that really hasn't happened in the past, and I really want to say thank you for that. Um, I think that this discussion is important, and I'm also kind of concerned about the fact that we're putting this ordinance on the ballot. I think it's a, a bit gutless 
of the supervisors to pass the buck when they know that there's a good chance that this um, this 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 ballot measure might not pass. In fact, I think that we're not reading the room very well, and you know, take for granted that you know the police union has a lot of money and might be able to push um, a push back against this. And even though this room is informed, I don't know if the average voter out in Sonoma County is, and that's kind of concerning for us. Um, if as a community, we're looking to make this change. And I just think that that's something that should be important. Um, I think that we should be included uh, further in these discussions. Um, it doesn't feel like sometimes people of color are actually being brought into this uh, as much as we should be. And these decisions are made on our behalf and not necessarily taking into account any opinions that we have. So for my purposes, I, I would really appreciate not putting this on the ballot. And I think that if you're going to do it, I think that the supervisors need to take a stand and make that call on their own. I would appreciate that. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. And it looks like we're sharing the screen with the timer that's still counting. If um, that can be turned off, please. Okay. Um, okay, the next person we are going to call on is Cecilia. Cecilia? And actually, Adriana, um, Adriana, one moment. Adriana? Uh, hi, this is Cecilia. Oh, hi. Is, is uh, Adriana there as well, please? I am. Sorry. Um, I'm having a hard time with the clock, but I think Adriana, I got it. Now. Can you please take down your shared screen and I will go ahead and keep time on this? Sure. Thank you. Hi, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm going to start the time right now. Thank you, uh, uh, Cecilia. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. My name is Cecilia. I'm a resident here in Sonoma County. I'm calling in because I strongly, strongly, strongly feel that we need to pass a, a Evelyn Cheatham uh, ordinance. I feel it's a crucial part of Iolero. Um, I think that you, some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware. I hope the listeners are aware that there is a very, very, very long list of uh, people of color in this county who very much support um, EOC and um, our EC. Oh, sorry. And I feel it's very important to pass it no matter what. I would love to see it with Carlene Navarro's uh, modifications. I think that those were great clarifications. I would love to see those implemented, but even if they aren't, I feel very strongly this needs to be on the ballot. I would love for the people to get to vote on it. And even if it fails at the ballot, I would like to see all of you committed to still passing this. My preference is to have the people decide because I like the modifications and I don't know what y'all's intentions are because this has taken a long time to get out here. And this is way overdue. We've lost too many lives. Too much violence has happened. This is like the bare, bare minimum. And again, you have a long list of people asking for this, a very long list that people are speaking. So please hear us. Please implement this. Please make sure that this makes it no matter what. It doesn't matter if it's on the ballot. If you guys do it after we get a chance to do it on the ballot with the modifications, that would be great. This is crucial. This is crucial and the people agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next person we are going to hear from, um, it says Ruben Scott, but I don't know if that's uh, Ruben Scott or, or somebody else, but whoever is there representing Ruben Scott. Hello, thank you. This is Ruben. Oh, Mr. Scott, thank you. Good. I actually wanted to talk to Duffy. I, I didn't get a chance to. What I noticed that when he said about the ordinance, he said that there was a clause within the ordinance which protected the ordinance if there was a certain uh, language that it didn't, didn't apply. And with that, I felt like, okay, we should hesitate and try to uh, amend the ordinance in a certain way, which would, um, what, would what was it? The, we would like, I would like to amend the ordinance, allow it to go to the Board of Supervisor, allow them to amend the ordinance. Um, so that way it doesn't go to voting. I feel like there should be no reason to hesitate on amending it. Um, I, I think that everything sounded good. I believe the body cameras, um, body cameras that we definitely need uh, in today's uh, culture and in the landscape what's going on. We definitely need the body cameras and a discipline in regards to dis discipline recommendations. So um, I, I, it, it seems kind of small, but I do, I do like the wording that uh, Iolero has put forth. 
and do agree that we should amend it using that wording. I don't see a hesitation or reason. Once again, especially when you look at the ordinance, there's a clause that says um, that it's protected, the whole ordinance will protect it if they don't like a certain language. So uh, that's pretty much all I have to say at this time. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to remind people we are taking public comment on the previous four presenters. Uh, the next person up is Keith R. Keith R. Should I reply to Ruben? Um, Jim, I'm sorry. He said he was addressing me. Should I reply to him? Um, I'm not sure if there was a question. I think he was addressing the uh, the saving clause regarding the savings clause. Um, but I, I'm not sure if there was a, a question to address, Jim. All right. I'll shut up. Oh, no worry. No, I, please. <laughs> um, Mr. Scott, did you have a specific question that you that you wanted to ask of Mr. Duffy? Okay, we'll, we'll pick up conversation later. We are gonna open it up more for, for more open conversations, um, if there are. Um, is uh, Keith R available? Go ahead, Keith. Okay, I'm here. All right, my name is Keith Reinhardt. I thank you for this opportunity. I'm so pleased to see so many community leaders at this meeting. And I wanna first say something that uh, Evelyn Sheetham was a fine woman who helped a lot of people. And I think it's wonderful that this ordinance is named after her. Uh, I believe Director Navarro brought up several good points in terms of strengthening the Office of Ayerlero. However, um, I'm like uh, Cecilia. I would like to see it voted in. And then if it didn't get voted in, um, I would like our Board of Supervisors to take some actions to make... Uh, the office stronger than it is so that we can hold law enforcement accountable uh, for bad behavior. And, and in my opinion, that would include probation and the district attorney. So again, kudos to the late El Evelyn Cheatham. What a, what a fine woman. She even put my kid to work for a day and he, he failed, but that's not her fault. She's a wonderful woman. Uh, I love that this is named after her and I would like to see it put on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, we're now gonna go to Chris with a K. Chris, just unmute yourself, great. Chris, just go ahead and unmute yourself uh, before you talk. I think you're able to talk. There you Hi, go. I got it, yeah. Hey, I am Chris. Um, I'm a Santa Rosa resident. I wanna see the initiative go on the ballot with the director's recommendations. And I wanna guarantee that the Board of Supervisors will commit to adopting measures to strengthen Iolero if the initiative fails. Say it tonight. A lot of us don't trust y'all. We wanna hear you say that you will strengthen Iolero. The fact that we have to fight and beg for accountability and transparency is ridiculous. Take responsibility for your community and protect us. I yield my time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the next person we have for public comment is Gustavo Ramirez. Gustavo, just uh, unmute and uh, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, yes, my name is uh, Gustavo uh, I, uh, Ramirez. I just wanna uh, thank everybody, uh, the Community uh, Advisory Council uh, for having this forum and uh, for all the community groups present and, uh, and then for, uh, of course, uh, Director Navarro. Uh, thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, I know a lot of people are worried about like the, the future board of supervisors changing any ordinance amendments to make ILR weaker. Um, I don't think that's the risk. Uh, I think the risk is in hoping that that the majority of voters in this county are going to pass this ordinance amendment in November. You know, it's it's like it just it, that, that's the part that concerns me probably the most. Um, if it fails and loses at the ballot box, we, I mean, do we have, can the, can, like the previous woman said, do we have a public promise from the supervisors that they'll pass the failed, you know, the failed amendment anyway? I mean, can you guys tell us that you will? Uh, if there's no public promise, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it just is gone and results in no changes being made and things thing gets pushed down, you know, for years down the road. Um, um, the other, I, I have concerns too about um, uh, 
the, the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, um, like the, there's people may not realize it, but I, I've been doing a lot of reading on it. And Jerry Three, who was the first Idolero director, he was responsible for writing that first ordinance. And it's it's the one that had it's. I know that Mr. Duffy had mentioned earlier that it was a, a, a like a. I forget, it was kind of a base to work on, but he wrote the first ordinance. It's got so many problems that we're now having to fix. Uh, so now we're having to count on this organization that seems to be involved with Mr. Three uh, to again, write another ordinance and then depend on that being accurate and go into the ballot box. I, I just, don't, I don't see it happening. I think we need to make the modifications. And I, I, I agree. I think the, Thank I think the Bob. supervisors need to have a backbone and they need to, they need to make the changes that are needed. Um, Thank you, Gustavo. That's uh, that's the time for today. Thank you. And again, I don't mean to cut people off if uh, the time is up, but we are uh, very limited on public comment and we do want to have as, as many people heard tonight as possible. Uh, Susan Lamont, uh, good evening. Thank you. Yes. Uh, some background. First, Jerry Threat was told what his restrictions were going to be, and they, he was severely limited, and it was not done by him. Also, there's been much mention of including communities of color here, but one important community is missing. They are the many who are too afraid of the sheriff's office to be here. There were once many Latinx folks seeking oversight of law enforcement. Some were Andy's friends. They were surveilled, arrested, harassed at their front doors, followed, handcuffed, and thrown face down on the street for hours, had their children deported. They dropped out in fear. There was already a significant portion of the BIPOC community that feared law enforcement before Andy was killed. Director Navarro has asked communities of color to come and speak their minds. Twice last year, I asked her what she planned to do to guarantee the safety of those rightfully fearful folks. I've never received an answer. But what I know, because I have worked with many of them, is that they appreciate the white folks who work and speak up on their behalf. We continue to be thanked for that work. And many may not know it, but Director Navarro has eliminated public involvement in the CAC. Under Director Three, it was strong, enough said. The history on this with the supervisors is not a good one. There have been concerted efforts to actually gut Iolero by Supervisor Rabbit and others according to the wishes of the sheriff. And it's interesting that those here are so dismissive of the democratic process and disrespectful of the electorate. But the actual question I have is, can the supervisors actually get this on the ballot in three days? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next person we have up for a public comment is Gabriel Solis. Gabriel Solis or Solis. Police, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, to Director Navarro for creating this uh, moment for us to comment. Uh, I have a problem with the, how the process happened. I find that it was very dismissive and patronizing for a group of white people to make changes to ILR ordinance without even inviting communities of color to have a seat at the table to, to uh, give their input about this uh, ordinance. Instead, we get a, they get a, they write a document then they go to black and brown people and say, here, sign this. They put a pretty label on it. Sounds great. Sign this and we'll take care of it for you. Uh, you know, even though the, the uh, proposal is named after Evelyn Cheatham, uh, you know, African-American community members, uh, you know, weren't even invited in uh, to, um, to create this document. I think that's a little bit disrespectful and hypocritical and exploitative. Um, you know, people of color uh, are the ones that are going to be uh, affected most by this ordinance, uh, impacted the most, and yet they're not uh, uh, asked to, invited in to, to contribute to this um, and be included, and, and then just go shove it straight to the ballot where it would likely uh, have uh, be strongly contested. Uh, we just want to be part of the dialogue. You know, we just want our ideas heard. We're not voiceless. Clearly, we have a voice, uh, and a lot of people are here. Uh, uh, expressing that, people of color, and that's, that's good, but uh, it needs to be in writing. It needs to be added in um, because we're the ones who uh, are where the rubber meets the road. 
uh, a lot of people who have participated in this and creating this, they're not living the life that we have lived. They're not uh, subject to the things that we have been subject to. And they're not, uh, it's not them that is being ground down, again, where the rubber meets the road. That's where we are. Uh, so that's concerning that that's going to be put on the ballot where it would be strongly uh, pushed back against and likely defeated. Uh, and then we're left once again with nothing. Um, Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, Daisy, uh, I see Daisy, no last name. Go ahead uh, once you are unmuted. Hi, um, my name is Daisy Pistiline. I'm here to um, say it's really important to put this on the ballot this November. Um, I work in politics and I haven't heard anyone say this, but a presidential election is an extraordinarily big opportunity. There's the largest turnout, it's the most liberal. If you're talking about concerns, this won't pass. If this doesn't go on the November 2020 ballot, it's way less likely to pass this type of um, reform in any other election until 2024. Right now we have support of a populace that cares about racial justice, it cares about police oversight in a way we've never seen before. And we need to ride that wave and get what we can in November 2020 because we're gonna have a huge turnout and it's gonna be much easier to talk to these people because it's a much more diverse and a much more liberal populace that turns out. Additionally, I don't understand why everyone is fearful of passing this by the voters. Um, I'm the former head of Sonoma County Conservation Action. In the history of environmental protection in this county, we have always put this under voter control. We've passed things at the ballot box, not letting it be under the control of city councils and boards of supervisors, because when they change, they can make amendments easily. If something is purely passed by a majority of a board, we need voter control to ensure that strong provisions are held in place by those voters and that amendments are only made by voters. This ordinance, as it's currently written, has been endorsed by a long list of organizations. I'm surprised that I don't know, I missed part of the presentation, but I see the NAACP, the Sonoma County Black Coalition, Sonoma County Latino Democratic Club, the um, Peace and Justice Center, the North Bay Organizing Project, North Bay um, Jobs with Justice. We have the Great and Day Labor Center, Comite Vida, the ACLU, the Racial Justice Allies. Like there's a lot of groups that represent many concerns in our community that have seen fit to um, say that this is something that should go on the ballot and that it will represent the interests of their communities and that it will be good for our communities. Thank, the you, board okay. Thank you. And again, I, I don't mean to cut people off. We are limiting public comment to two minutes. Uh, thank you very much for your public comments. Um, again, please restrict public comment to the four presenters that we heard before us. Uh, the Iolero director, um, Evelyn Cheatham, uh, Christine Burke, or Karen Feast. Uh, from Human Services. Uh, Stephen Fabian, um, there's two people listed, so Stephen Fabian, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Fabian. Uh, I used to be uh, on the board of the ACLU of Sonoma County as well as the ACLU of Northern California. I'm a deputy public defender. I spent time circulating these petitions uh, up until the coronavirus hit and we had to shut everything down. And I was going to farmers markets and people were very, very excited about this and uh, wanted this to happen. And I was getting hardly any refusals of people not wanting to uh, lend their name to these petitions. I think that the amendments though that are being uh, sought are good amendments, I think we should adopt them. And I'm, my main concern is that we're having this meeting so close to the time where we have to have this decision made. I wish this would have, this should have happened a month or two ago. This, but this um, ordinance has been around for a long time and to have it done where it's the last second uh, seems uh, very unwise, but I think we have to go to the voters on this. Uh, I think that right now the Board of Supervisors are under huge financial restraints. It's gonna be hard for them to put away a quarter of a million dollars for this and there's no, uh, sense that they're going to have, they're going to have that continual funding uh, that will be needed to make this uh, Iolero a vibrant um, organization that can continue to the future. So I, I think that going to the populace is where we should go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next individual I see is Frank, uh, no last name, go ahead.
Frank, just unmute yourself and you can uh, begin speaking. Okay. Yeah, now we can hear you. Go ahead, Frank. Frank, we can't hear you. Are you there? Not not much better. Are you? Can you hear us? I got too many. Okay, you're good now, Frank. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll try to. Um, it might be a little curt here, so I hope I don't uh, you know, take that into consideration. Um, 30, 40 years ago, I was writing research in the uh, Assembly Office of Research in Sacramento. So I've gone through a lot of hearings and uh, narratives and committees like this. Uh, in the last six or nine months uh, the CAC was meeting, I had the uh, uh, pleasure of watching um, a great presenters from our Sheriff's Department and our director, Jerry Threat, or three, uh, work out together. Um, and I thought the people were really, uh, you know, a great presentation, uh, a great collaboration. But in the end, it was the same old narrative, quite honestly, is that uh, Gary, there was finger pointing from um, the, the head of the sheriff's department and the senior sheriff people that he wasn't being fair. And uh, quite honestly, I witnessed him and I thought he was being fair, but I don't know, I don't know what the truth is. The point is, is we ended up in the same place, okay? where decades and decades, the, the, um, the police authority has, um, has uh, rebelled against this kind of intervention. So what I'm wondering, Sheriff and Officer Cutting, is it? In this small town, okay, this is not St. Louis, it's not Philadelphia, it's not Minneapolis, it's not Dallas, in this small town, can you guys, I'm sorry, can you guys go to another level and you, can you embrace this credibility, this transparency that these other people are testifying about? Moving along, I, um, I really believe that, you know, I'm here. Thank you, Frank. That's, uh, that's the time, unfortunately. Thank you, Frank. I recommend. Um, again, please keep your comments to the previous four presenters. If they do go off topic, we may have to end early and push you to the end. Um, we are only taking topics of these four. Um, I see we have a, a, uh, some people left that I do want to get to. Um, Mark, uh, please go ahead, Mark. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, my name is Mark Goitam. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a part of the Sonoma County Black Coalition. This narrative that um, black and brown people have not uh, been educated on what the evidence sheet and bill is and have not signed on, on onto it um, is not only offensive, but racist. Uh, we have been doing workshops with people of color, uh, multiple different groups, like all the groups that were named before, the United Black Leadership, Love and Light, um, uh, uh, what we fight for, uh, so many different groups. We've been doing workshops on this uh, Evelyn Chief of Ordinance, and we've all come to the conclusion, the majority of us have come to the conclusion that we want to see this bill on the ballot. We want the power to be with the people. We understand the risk. This idea that we don't understand the risk is highly offensive also. Uh, we understand the risk. We understand what kind of county we're living in. Um, we don't want to give the power to the Board of Supervisors because the, ma the simple matter of fact is, if the Board of Supervisors knew what was best, this would have been done 10 years ago. Um, and I don't want to go into all, to all my personal experiences, what I've been through, being pulled over three times in one route by uh, police, police officers, um, or having a gun pointed at me uh, for having a headlight out um, a day before my high school graduation by Eric Jailhouse, the same officer who killed Andy Lopez. Um, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because we need police oversight now and we need it to happen on the ballot. We need the people to vote for it so that the people have control of it. If the Board of Supervisors, the City Council, and all of you guys really cared about us, it would have been done by now. So please put it on the ballot. Um, let the people speak for themselves. We know what's going on. We are educated people. We're not um, a bunch of 
uh, people just signing off on something that we don't know nothing about. We've done extensive work on this. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, I still see we have 25 people who wish to give public comment. Please leave your hands raised. Um, however, what I'm going to do now, I am going to move on to some of our other panelists. When we open up again for public comment, you will be able to comment on the first four people as well as the next few. Um, but I do want to open it up so some of our panelists can speak again. But again, we will let you speak for public comment. Keep your hands raised and uh, we will come back to you. Um, I, I do want to open this up now to our panelist, uh, Della Shea Carmona Benson. Are, are you here? Yes. Uh, Della Shea, go ahead and uh, give your presentation. Again, we're going to move with some of our presentations and then give our uh, community another opportunity to speak shortly. Okay, hey, my name is Della Shea Carmona Benson, and I'm here on behalf of BSU, Black Student Union, and UBL, Uplifting Black Leaders of Santa Rosa in Sonoma County. And um, as I'm sitting here listening to what everyone's saying, the first thing that comes to mind is, why are we having this conversation anyway? I'm sitting here thinking like, why are we in this meeting? Why, you know, this, this office has been open for quite a while. And why are we now having a meeting that includes so many different cultures, so many different races? Um, and that includes when Jerry was there, and that includes when Carleen was there. It's been a minute. So that's the first thing that came to my mind. The next thing is that I'm really concerned about the body cameras and not being trans, you know, it should be more transparency to them. I think that those recordings should be open to the public immediately. Um, having body cameras really to me, solves a lot of things that I think the police tends to hide. And, and that's the only way I'm gonna keep it is just raw and real. And having them being more accountable to those cameras, I think helps a lot. The fact that some of these cases with the cameras are only allowed if the media is involved is what I was told. And what about cases that the media is not involved? Like, some of the cases that I just heard, having a police man put a, a gun to your face before graduation, like, what about that? Um, the police's job is, is, is very important. And the trust and transparency just depends on the effectiveness of the law enforcement has, and police depend enormously on the relationship that they have with the community they serve. And right now, this community is a climate of tension. There's no trust. And why should we trust the police? The police have not given us any reason to trust them. I'm 50 years old, and I can tell you in 50 years, I still haven't gotten one reason to trust the police. But I do think that the police cameras are important because it does reduce, stop, you know, reduce stops. It, it won't fix everything. But I think that you get a faster res resolution when there's police cameras involved from this excessive use and force from the police. But I'm still wondering, again, why it took us so long to get to this point. Are there going to be more meetings where we're all included after it's put on the ballot? That's, that's the real question that I have. And, and so, and so my thing is ballot versus board. Do we trust this board to, to listen to us? Because by what I see, they haven't. I haven't, I haven't seen any proof of them thinking about people of color. Um, do, can we trust that this ballot is gonna pass? Well, I'm gonna tell you something. I argue with so many people that, that Trump was gonna win. And they kept telling me, no, nah, there's no way Trump is going to win. And I told them, this is a racist country, and you have a racist running for president. Trust me, he's going to win. Trump won. So can we sit back and say, oh, because we have so many people here, this is going to pass? I don't know. 
I don't know. So at this moment, I would tell you that I'm going to sit back and listen some more before I really give my opinion as to if this should be ballot or board. But I can tell you, I don't trust the board. Thank you. Thank you, Delachey. Um, opening it up to our CAC members, uh, if anybody has any uh, questions, comments, uh, anything uh, for Delachey that you'd like to ask, uh, please uh, do so. Anybody? Okay. Um, uh, opening it up to our next panelist, uh, Kathleen Finnegan with the uh, Police Brutality Coalition. Okay. I, just thought I, did the, I did the wrong thing here. Hang on. We can hear you. Okay, you don't need to see me. I don't, I don't care if you see me, but you, you can hear me. Hear you. Oh, good. All right. So uh, essentially, the, 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 what's happening in this meeting is that uh, I'm throwing out the script here that I have written uh, because I wanted to read the long list, or at least a lot of the long list of um, people who have endorsed this initiative. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do that because Jim's gonna put it up. You're gonna have have be able to see it. I will try maybe to to do a few. But starting with the facts of the matter, we are too painfully aware that the sheriff's office has a long history of refusing to release essential files and video footage to the public and to the independent auditors, particularly in cases of excessive force, injuries, and deaths, and deputies' fatal shootings of unarmed civilians the preponderance of whom are people of color. The Evelyn Freedom Ordinance corrects these fatal flaws by granting subpoena power to the appendant auditor, as well as appropriate funding that Iolero needs to get the job done. The ordinance has been read and enthusiastically approved by a huge swath of people in our community of all stripes, colors, and political bents, and you name it. And I, I, I'm not gonna read this list, it's, but I can tell you that the numbers of people of color on this list, uh, you know, that list alone would is is, law, uh, is, is, is as long as I am tall. Uh, there are dozens and dozens and dozens. The process has been an open one from, you know, from the get go, and I I consider it a privilege that we have been actually asked by Evelyn Cheatham, and that we are carrying on the work that she started. And we do it in the same spirit that she always uh, exuded as far as what needs to be done. Um, I, I think that, um, please do read this list of, of endorsements, many of whom are here tonight, many, many organizations. And so the fact of the matter is that it seems that, that Director Navarro doesn't want these powerful endorsements to count. Um, I suggest that anyone who would be mistaken enough to denigrate and invalidate the voices and choices of all those listed here and those who have joined us tonight would be dealing a terrible insult to all the good citizens who have already made it perfectly clear that they want the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance passed into law just as it is. We know that amendments can be made after the uh, the issue, the um, the, uh, if you pass this on the ballot, we're going to we're going to get it passed. We're going to get it passed. We'll have more meetings once it's placed on the ballot. You bet we'll have more meetings. Everybody will have more input. But this last minute stuff is clearly um, it, uh, an impossible situation. The, the board of supervisors has to decide tomorrow. Uh, furthermore, I think you know it's absolutely important, and we have. Uh, uh, honored this, uh, that communities be, in all our communities be included in the discussion. And I would ask then, um, what happened to the, the, um, the ordinance that Ms. Navarro wrote last year? She wrote an ordinance and they, it, it failed with the Board of Supervisors, it was withdrawn or whatever, whatever. I don't believe that it was uh, uh, an issue that she consulted with any people of color to write that her ordinance, but it's, it's an issue now. And in fact, we have done the consultations. We have, we have championed the rights of all people who are abused by police. And I think that it is clear, the people are speaking, have spoken, and they, they have made it clear. 
They want this ordinance passed into law now, just as it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Finnegan. Um, is uh, Diana Grant available? Diana Grant? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I was trying to find chat to ask, to ask you a question, but I guess one of my colleagues did, good. Um, I'm thinking, speaking for the Criminology and Criminal Justice Studies Department at Sonoma State, I think this is a very important conversation, obviously, and it's really great to hear so many things that so many people have to see and have to say. What I think we could say is that we are working with the IOLARO on two research projects, and this conversation tonight just shows how important it is to look to research, try to find how it can be used to inform things like policy changes. Um, for example, we're doing research looking at what other, what the other counties in California, what their sheriff's offices are doing in terms of use of force policies and de-escalation policies. We're also looking at best practices for developing community policing. We've got our students involved in that. We've got most of the department, pretty much all the department working on that. Um, that doesn't tell us what we should do in terms of perhaps going to the ballot box or the board of, of supervisors which I'm certainly each of us has an individual opinion about that probably, but it does say that the research is going to be important here to keep in mind in terms of will the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, um, will it succeed? Um, if it's at the ballot box, can it be amended? What are the political considerations? So let me end my, my short little um, observations here by saying this just shows me once again as a longtime researcher and many other people here whether you're activists or uh, researchers or students or community members or politicians doesn't matter that it's one thing to say this is something that should be done and it's another thing to look at the political and organizational and in this case time constraints that we're dealing with. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call now is uh, Alondra from uh, Sonoma Immigrant Services. Are you here, Alondra? Yes, I'm here. Um, my name is Alondra Marroquin. I work as a legal assistant at Sonoma Immigrant Services with Vicki Handren, an immigration attorney. Our mission is to empower our community and while trying our best to do so, we have received several complaints about law enforcement. We were shown a video of an encounter that took place in Sonoma Valley of a Latino man and a police officer. The Latino man, while face down with the officer on top of him, had his head forcefully slammed multiple times on the cement ground as he repeatedly yelled out in Spanish that he did not speak English and asked what the problem was. Another complaint was brought to us by a young undocumented woman who called the police after she was physically assaulted. The officers who responded were dismissive, told her to go home, and told her she could not file a police report unless she was a citizen. We proudly support the ideals of defunding the police for obvious reasons. In my opinion, the majority of these issues have to do with racism. The report recently submitted by the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights provides factual evidence about the damages that have been created in our communities by the hands of law enforcement. As mentioned in the report, since the year 2000, 91 community members have been killed in an incident involving law enforcement. The ongoing cases of police brutality and the murders of black, brown, and indigenous people have created extreme fear and mistrust towards law enforcement. We have seen this sentiment by all of our clients as well. Strict oversight on law enforcement is an urgent matter. Therefore, we believe all proposals made by the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and by Carlene Navarro, which are aimed to straighten Yolero, are obvious and necessary and must be put on the upcoming ballot. We believe these are the minimal changes necessary to provide Yolero with the ability to effectively do their job. In the past, the Board of Supervisors has failed to consider these recommendations made by Yolero. Board of Supervisors have an obligation to all their constituents 
by adopting the exact recommendations in the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance and considering regulations to change the practices and policies and procedures of the Sheriff's Office, including the divisiveness they create through their social media accounts. The Board of Supervisors have an opportunity once again to stand for all constituents. We cannot allow law enforcement to continue getting away with things. It's time, it's been time to hold law enforcement accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to take one more uh, presenter before we open up to a brief public comment again. Uh, Ms. Barbosa Suarez. I hope, sorry for not, not pronouncing your name correctly. Hey, yeah, Barbosa Suero. Um, not everyone gets it. Um, so hi, I'm Kimi Barbosa Suero, and I'm a community member who's been active in organizing for immigrant rights, criminal justice reform, and equity in this county, as well as California for about 10 years. I'm a former incarcerated youth and a Brazilian immigrant, probably multicultural, multilingual, and I spent my entire academic career focusing on social inequalities and social policy, earning my undergraduate degree in sociology and my master's in public policy. So first I wanna point out how inaccessible these meetings are and how inaccessible the board meetings are as many community members who feel lost in the process at best, targeted when they speak up or cut up abruptly when they are finally given a moment to speak. Um, and by the way, we have been doing the community outreach for you. Love and Light, Uplifting Black Leaders, Sonoma County Black Coalition. We've been creating media to educate our peers because um, all of you who own the table haven't had the interest to do so. So I wanna applaud the idea as well of um, long-term community engagement, but let's be real. Once things die down, all those ideas for inclusion are gonna to fall to the wayside. So we, the community, really need to take advantage of the position we are in to make concrete changes before you all forget about us again. So I'm here to advocate that the independent oversight of the Sheriff's Office is desperately needed and that we need to put the Evelyn Cheatham Initiative on the ballot. So 20 years ago, a report came out about excessive use of force in Sonoma County. We've had two children murdered by the Sheriff's Office since then, that's Jeremiah Chas and Annie Lopez, and many other adult humans have been killed, tortured, and assaulted by the Sheriff's deputies in that time. Now there's a new report from the Human Rights Commission that highlights, is, um, highlights police use of force in this county. And my question is how many more reports and deaths and torture is needed before Sonoma County Board of Supervisors finally supports an office for police oversight to operate effectively. Without funding and access to information, this office will stand as an empty promise as it has for the last five years. As a community member who is on the ground, I see and hear the frustration among residents who are young and black indigenous people of color. I'm sure you hear us and our frustration. It's loud and clear when we march and when we call into your meetings. The Board of Supervisors and the City Council have been getting grilled in the last few weeks. And that's because they're not heard. And what else can we do? Our voices are usually ignored by um, decision makers until they find it politically in their favor to hear us. And then your attempts to actually hear us are feeble at best. We don't trust the board to adopt this ordinance and keep it intact because that's how we got here in the first place. And that's why we need to vote on police oversight with the Evelyn Cheatham Initiative so the power stays with the people and not to an all white board who doesn't actually support these measures. We want the Evelyn Cheatham Initiative to go on the ballot as is or with the recommendations made by Carly Navarro. I think she points a lot of good loopholes out and the ones that she has expressed during this meeting I think should be adopted. But nonetheless, it should be put on the ballot. Um, there's also been, um, specifically we need it on the ballot because the funding mechanisms was really needed. Um, so there's been some discussion about whether or not the funding mechanism is legal. Um, and personally, I'm willing to take my chances in courts because frankly, we have nothing to lose. It'll just put us right back where we are. So we finally, again, have a national movement and dialogue that's asking who polices the police. We're tired of waiting until the board decides when it wants to listen and to and protect communities of color. We're tired of lip service from an all white board and we see through a lot of these gains. We want this initiative on the ballot and we want the board to also make a commitment that if the initiative fails for whatever reason, the bunches of money that's coming in from opposition, coronavirus, um, you know, kind of dismantling our ability to do grassroots organizing. I want the board to say that they're committed to actually putting measures in place that will support the ILR office. But first and foremost, the goal is to get this on the ballot so the people have control of this. If it fails, y'all need to make a commitment on record now that you will support at adopting measures to strengthen the office so it can actually operate effectively. So again, I don't trust you enough to adopt this measure, but I sure as hell don't want you to wash your hands of it if big money beats us. 
This is hella basic, people. This isn't even defunding the police, which is what the nation is calling for right now. This is barely getting us to a point to even start weeding out bad apples. If we put this initiative on the ballot on November, we just need to do it now. We need to quit killing time. The time was yesterday. It was five years ago when ILRA was established. I mean, actually, it was like 20 years ago when the first report came out. And in addition, we need more representation um, in decision making in Sonoma County in general. I want to see more of the commissions, councils, and boards of Sonoma County have representation of people of color, real opportunities for people of color to take on leadership roles. I want to see more people of color from multiple disciplinaries as part of the CAC's research team, which is just three um, Sonoma State students who are wanting to go into criminal justice. Like, we need sociology, we need humanities, we need a multidisciplinary approach for research, too. I want to see black and brown faces and multilingual humans on the board of supervisors so that we have a voice even when you decide to finally forget about us again. I am fed up with monocultural in this area. More diversity means less BS when we talk about these issues and less butchering of Latinx names. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I am going to open it up to our CAC members. We've heard a few more presenters. Um, do any of our CAC members have any questions for the recent presenters? Okay, um, I am going to open it up again to some brief public comments. Um, again, please keep your public comment at this point focused on the presenters that we've heard so far and not general public comment. That will come at the end. Um, I am going to go, we have uh, 23 people raising their hands. I'm going to get through a few before we move on to our next presenters, um, but I do want to open it up again briefly. Um, is Joe A, Joe A available for uh, public comment? Yes, I'm here. Great, go ahead, Joe. Thank you. Um, I just wanna thank you and everyone and all the different booths for present that presented tonight. It's great to hear different thoughts and sides from community groups representing people of color here tonight. In the past, I'm not very certain Iolero has ever actually focused and consciously aimed to include people of color being part of the conversation. I do have concerns about putting this ballot, putting this proposal on the ballot. What if it does not pass? If it doesn't pass, will supervisors even make any changes or will they say that the community has spoken and that would be the end? I want to stress tonight that I feel that there needs to be community dialogue, especially with community groups from the minority community in representing and advocating our needs and ensuring that these needs and concerns are not dismissed. We, and I say hence those of us of color, are the ones who get victimized by police violence and we are the communities who would be most impacted by this ordinance. Um, Supervisor Hopkins, I hope that you are starting to understand, and I'm pleading with you to listen in here, that having an ordinance amendment written and brought to us for our signature is not the same, and I stress, it's not the same as inviting us to speak for ourselves and have an input on writing the actual document. There's a lot of um, community groups present tonight, but I'm almost confident there's probably quite a few that are not present tonight and who we should talk to and should be included in moving forward. How can that happen if this has to go on the ballot by tomorrow? Um, I just wanna thank you guys all for your hard work, commitment and openness to including people of color in what you're doing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person I'd like to call is Donna Zapata. Donna Zapata. Go ahead, Donna, um, please unmute and you can speak when you're available. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you uh, for one, for taking, taking this, uh, having this presentation for us to make comment about. Um, I have lived in Sonoma County all my life. I'm a very active Latina person and have been active and continue to be active. And I have seen ups and downs with all of this. But I'd like to address this to Director Navarro. I would like to see uh, the initiative or the ordinance be presented to the Board of Directors with your changes, which I think only straighten, strengthens and, and, and tightens everything of this ordinance and present it to the Board of Supervisors and 
because of the risk of the cost and the voter re uh, rejected and the political climate in itself. John, are you people, people of color. The people of color, we have not been at the table or we are and we are not heard. I urge the border supervisors to walk their talk. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person I'm going to call for public comment again on the previous speakers we've heard from is uh, Delisa, no last name listed, Delisa or Delisa. Hi, Delisa. Great, thank you. Delisa Wood. Hi, I am um, a mother of four and um, my husband and I are, um, we both believe that this, this um, ordinance should be on, absolutely should be on the ballot. Um, I, we know a, a list full, a long list of people of color like ourselves um, that believe the same. And I just feel like if not now, when? And for the, you know, the Board of Supervisors, what we're asking you to do is to amplify our voices, to put this on the ballot, to allow the people to choose. It's really that simple. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person I will call is Ken Norton. Ken Norton for public comment. Can you hear me now? Yes. My name is Elaine B. Holtz. I'm the president of the National Organization for Women, Sonoma County Chapter, and we have approved, we have supported the ILRO initiative to go on the ballot. But I'm here to speak as a mother as a grandmother, as a great grandmother. I was very involved with Andy Lopez. I went to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting and I asked one question, what would you do if this was your child? And nothing has been done. Three circuit courts said abusive force was used and the Board of Supervisors voted to spend the money to go to the Supreme Court that denied it. They can't give $15 an hour a raise, but they went to the Supreme Court to prove this man not guilty of excessive force and nothing was being done. And it's an insult to me as an 80 year old woman who has voted since I've been 21 years old, because it wasn't 18 years old, that you would say that the voters will not come to the polls for this. I know that the people of color in this community will come out in numbers to support this initiative. And what are we so afraid of? We have the sheriff here. Sheriff Essex, what are you scared of? You should call on this to happen. It makes your officer safer. It makes the whole community safer. I asked one question. How would you feel if that was your 13-year-old son on the floor dead and the policeman had a handcuff on him and that man got promoted? And I found out today that he was actually elected to be vice president of an organization. And he had, he had white supremacist images on his, on his Facebook, on his uh, website. We need to put this on the ballot. And we need the Board of Supervisors. There are three women on there. Women who have been given the charge to bring life into this world will not pass something like this or make more improvement. The only way that we can get it done is through the ballot. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for doing this. And I'm, one last thing I want to say, gossip has it, hearsay has it, whatever you want to call it, that going to the meeting are very uncomfortable, that there's not a welcoming of the community. There is not a welcoming to come, come to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, and again, I apologize if I cut anybody off, but we are trying to get to as many uh, speakers as possible today. Um, Elizabeth, uh, Fujeri, Fugeri, Elizabeth, I apologize uh, for mispronouncing your last name. That's okay, it's Elizabeth Fuger. And hey, like yes, real quick, I wanted to, uh, everyone's made some really great points, so quickly, I support this going to the ballot as is. This last minute meeting, after this ordinance has been out for a very long time, asking for people of color to put their input, well, 
people of color have put their input into this ordinance. They have worked on this ordinance and they have helped put petitions on this ordinance. They will be able to speak again before this ordinance is even on the ballot and with their vote. So with their input, we will want to pass this because the Board of Supervisors created the ILR office with community support and it was lacking. It was lacking then. We always needed, knew it needed more. So here we are. We're going to ask for more, what we need, and put it on the vote because I am lucky enough to visit all around the county working for the library. I meet lots of people and they are educated and they are invested and they want to see accountability for the tens of millions spent legal fees, settlements for misconduct, brutality, even just simple little lies of officers. It is unacceptable. I would love to see this be a community effort in partnership with the Sheriff's Office. So I, I'm not even just speaking up to the Board of Supervisors. I want to see you, Sheriff Essex. I want to see you, Brandon Cutting, support this Iolero ordinance because you need the oversight. The only thing that I would ask is that with the recommendations um, for the current director, the only one I had a problem with was the disciplinary recommendation. And maybe I need to look into that more. I understand why you would want to know what the discipline was, but to recommend discipline, I think is inappropriate. I think that's gonna create a culture of silence and that the good apples are gonna protect the bad apples. The sheriff office is an employer and needs to have clear guidelines. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I am going to open it up now to our panelists again. We're going to go back to our panelists. We do have a lot of people we are trying Excuse to. Excuse me. Can you hear me? You just unmuted my microphone. That was really rude. I was waiting. Uh, okay. I'm. I'm not sure who's speaking right now. Well, um, you you unmuted my microphone. My name is M. It's up on the screen. Okay, um, uh, we're gonna come right back to you then shortly. I, I uh, no, no, you only took a few, so I would. I... Okay, we're we're gonna come back to M. Um, we're gonna go now with the rest of our, um, not the rest, but we're gonna continue with some of our uh, panelists. We do have a lot of people we want to hear from, and we will get back to M uh, for the next public comment. Um, I'd like to call on Ronald Lopez. Um, I do see you're raising your hand. He's one of our panelists. Uh, go ahead, Ronald. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm the chair of Chicago and Latino Studies at Sonoma State University. And um, I have uh, spoken to a number of people on different sides of this measure. I really like the comments made by Kiki Barbosa Soera. Uh, and I want to um, basically second her comments. I would like to see this be put on the ballot. I would also like to see the supervisors pass it in the meantime. Uh, and uh, to have like provisions that we can continuously strengthen it. Um, I've, in talking to people, I've talked to people on both sides, there's a lot of bitter feelings, there's a lot about this that's been made personal. And I think it's important that we think about this as the office and the safety of our families, our friends, our neighbors and children. Uh, my daughter years ago was in a mariachi camp with Andy Lopez and um, you know, she spoke very highly of him, uh, as did many others. I feel very strongly that the voters should have a, a place in this, but also that the Board of Supervisors should take a stand and actually represent the citizens and the other non-citizen residents of this community fairly so that we feel protected and safe. I do not feel safe calling the police or the sheriffs. I do not feel that my children and my friends are safe in this community. I know for a fact that students, especially young men of color leaving Sonoma State University are regularly harassed uh, as they drive home to their homes in various parts of the county and beyond. Uh, it's, a really, it's a real problem. Let's vote on this. Let's also put it on the ballot. Let's also strengthen it and give it teeth and make it mandatory that the police and the very and the sheriff's office uh, basically comply in their duty, their sworn duty to represent the community that they are supposed to protect. So those of you who are at calling for that, I support that. 
I support those those efforts. Um, and uh, I'm I'm going to yield back any remaining time that I have. That's that's basically all I wanted to say for tonight. So thank you all, and thank you for being here, and thank you for your continued commitment to this effort. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Um, the next uh, presenter or panelist I'd like to call is uh, Elias Hinnett uh, from Sonoma County Black Coalition. Are you available? Damien, is that going to be you speaking? Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Damien. I'm a representative and a member of the Sonoma County Black Coalition. Uh, we're here today basically entertaining yet another spectacle using the safety of people's lives in this county as a topic of dialogue and debate. When we leave this meeting, we are the people, black people, brown people, that can get murdered in these streets and have no one held accountable. Laws supposedly protecting black people is a complete farce. And I know you know that. We know that you know that. The board, along with other powers that be, have been repressing and attempted to confuse the public for decades, as stated earlier. Year after year, law enforcement have been virtually untouchable in this city and county, and we have the physical and emotional scars to not only show it, but to prove it. This is not a game. We are literally mm -hmm. talking about life and death for us and our children in Sonoma County. So, we, the Sonoma County Black Coalition, in alignment and in solidarity with our other constituents are advocating for the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance to be put on the ballot. In addition to being put on the ballot, we'd like the Board of Supervisors, yes you, to verbally commit to establishing the ordinance if the initiative fails and only have the power to amend it if it is involved in strengthening our level as opposed to weakening it. For the people here unfamiliar with us, Sonoma County Black Coalition we want you to know we have been here for a long time. We've been here all along, watching and listening as we will continue to do so. Dillian and dallying around the topics concerning more transparency, wasting time clarifying simple terms and dialoguing around the mere safety of our people in this county is completely and unequivocally unacceptable. And we're not gonna tolerate it anymore. Many of you all know what needs to be done. And some of you, and we know who you are, and some of you are even stopping the necessary progress for true equity and accountability in this county. We want you to know we see you and that we will continue to fight you for the right to exist in this county by any means necessary. All power to the people. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the next uh, person I'd like to hear from uh, presenter is uh, Maria Hasso from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Hi, this is Maria Hasso. professionals as well. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, thank oh, you, Maria. Uh, yes, my name is Maria Hasso, and I am representing the Hispanic Chamber of Young Professionals, as well of, as myself being a small business owner here in Sonoma County. I own a bilingual Montessori preschool. Um, and in our program, we definitely teach ch children about community and about police officers. And um, we have, you know, in, we have seen children in the news and young children who have been out there and um, being a part of this movement, right? So it's very interest, if it's very important for us to be, you know, um, transparent with our children and we want them to feel safe and we want them to be represented. Um, but one concern that does come to play is that a lot of the people that are being impacted by police uh, force are people that do not have a voice, people who do not have the privilege to vote because it is a privilege that not all of us have. So one of our concerns is if this, if this is measures put up in the ballot, um, will it be fully, uh, will it be accurate? Will it be fully accurate? Because many of us are able and want and desire to be able to vote, but can we really do so? So how could we really be represented? Um, and that is a very, very key vital point for our community is how can we be sure that we will be heard? 
Um, so many people are, you know, in the shadows. So many people are professionals that are here through DACA who want to be involved, who are community leaders, but are not able to voice themselves in the way that they wish that they could be heard. Um, so what we would like to happen is if this measure was to, um, you know, be put on the ballot and it was to not be um, pass in, would we have a representatives be able to speak for us? Would we be able to have them be the ones who, um, you know, make, make sure that our voices are heard? Um, or if it was vice versa, um, if they would be able to represent our community that very much needs them, and if not, then we could put it on the ballot. So it could go either way. I could see, you know, each one of these options um, being options that could get us to a better point that we need to be at. We definitely need to have more representation in our community. And we just ask that our representatives please be the voice for the people that cannot vote because we really need your support. It's vital. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, next, I'd like to hear, there's, um, let me see, there's a few people from Second Chance available. Uh, is it Julio that's going to be speaking from Second Chance? I know we have a few panelists uh, from that organization. Hi, I'm Julio Torres. Uh, I'm a student at the uh, Santa Rosa Junior College and a proud member of the uh, Second Chance Club. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Um, unfortunately, I have had a uh, gun pointed at me and know the terror that it brings. Many don't. Um, it, you, you go into a state of shock. Um, you, you don't know. It, it, the cop has to re, um, repeat what they say for it to register in your brain while you have a gun pointed at your face. And they go up to cars after a simple traffic stop just to and point their guns at them. That that's just there needs to be a line that goes into that. Um, like how far, like can they cross? You know, that's um, also I've been in situations where, um, for example, my mother passed by a situation where um, I was gotten, I got it pulled over, and the cop. Uh, is able what put his hand over the camera just to shoo her away basically long long story short and what and that and that happened twice so it's um it's pretty unfortunate that these situations happen and um and they know if everybody knows that it's happening i mean some everybody doesn't know what's happening but it's Finally, it's it's coming to a point where this ballot should be coming should should be presented, and I really support it. Uh, being um, seeing so many people of color in here, and and all of us together, and if it doesn't, then we all know that there's there's more work to be done. And just reading up on everything that has been um, brought to brought to the table it shows a lot of progression but there's still a lot of be, a lot of work to be done so i really uh thank you for letting me be a part of this thank you julio uh i, I do want to have one more presenter give uh, some comment before we open it up again to brief public comment um and of course i'll remind everybody at the end of all this the cac and presenters will be discussing some of those those seven questions that um were presented so we can get some uh, ideas of what we want to recommend to our supervisors uh, who may be taking action as early as tomorrow. Um, is uh, Malinali Lopez available and uh, wish to speak on behalf of uh, um, SSU Chicano Studies and XQL Media? Um, hi, Evan. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear right. me? Yes, I can. Um, hi, um, I, I just have, you know, a, a couple of comments because I've been listening carefully to what everybody has to say here and I'm learning a lot as I'm um, hearing people speak. And the first thing that I want to say is that um, I just want to thank um, Carly Navarro for inviting so many people to this meeting and allowing so many voices um, to be heard here tonight. Um, I want to echo the sentiment that somebody said earlier that, you know, I think that this is the first time that I know of 
that so many people of color have been invited to speak. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I do want to say that I support the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance. And I'm one of the people that actually um, signed my support for that. Um, but I also do um, emphatically support Carly Navarro's um, recommendations. I think that they're very important because the language that she has written um, allows for somebody um, like myself and others who are non-attorneys to understand, you know, the extent of, um, you know, the implications of, of the language that she's proposing. So that, that's really important. Um, I've also been, um, again, you know, listening to what everybody has to say. And I have to say, it's very painful, you know, to hear these stories, you know, because uh, even in my own family, like so many people have just been persist persistently stopped um, by the police uh, without having committed a violation of any kind, but just stopped, you know, just based on how they look. So it's very, very, very painful for me to, um, you know, hear these stories. You know, um, I feel that I myself have been stopped, um, you know, also for not committing a violation, but just based on the way that I look. And um, it's, it's just a very painful confession, you know, to make here tonight. Um, so I, I agree. I just want to echo everybody's sentiments that have already spoken up about the Board of Supervisors really need to step up and adopt the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance, but also with uh, Director Navarro's recommendations. It's, it's really important because I think that, you know, this is a moment in time in history where you can really show our community that you fully support us, you know, that you support the safety of um, African Americans, of Indigenous people, of Latinos um, and, and Mexican people, you know, and I, I say that because I think um, there's a, a such a big population of the Latino community that's Mexican here. And I, and I think we need to be um, also very specific about, you know, who our community is and really understand, um, you know, who is here. And um, I, I do think that, you know, we need to be shown by our political leaders that you're here for us and that you support us. So um, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have a few presenters left. Um, I'm gonna call a couple more uh, before we open up for some public comments, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish off with a few at the end. Uh, the next one I'd like to call is Napoleon Reyes uh, from Sonoma State. All right, good evening. Hi, Napoleon. Um, Napoleon Reyes, I'm the chair of the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice Study at Sonoma State University. I really like the provisions of the evidence sheet and ordinance, but I like the proposal by put forward by Director Carlene Navarro because it's more specific. And you know, I practiced criminal law before I got into the academe, and it's very important that you do not leave any loophole, wiggle room when you're trying to implement the law. Also, I like that I see, really see no inconsistency between the, uh, the ordinance as uh, put forth and then the um, proposal um, given by Carlene Navarro because they're both addressing the issue of accountability and transparency. So I think um, our collective goal is strengthening transparency and accountability. And I think combining both will be helpful toward achieving those goals. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to open up now to a brief public comment. Again, this is only specifically regarding the previous presentations we've heard. Um, and then we will uh, conclude and um, we'll go from there. Uh, M, I apologize for not getting to you before. I'm going to open up public comment starting with M, E M M. Um, if you can, uh, we're going to unmute you and you can uh, go ahead and uh, speak when you're unmuted. Go ahead, M. Thank you very much. Um, so I would just like to represent and say that we definitely want this on the ballot. We do not trust the Board of Supervisors to make these decisions. Um, we trust the people. If possible, we would like all of Navarro's amendments made um, and put into Ilero so we can vote on it. If not, we'll just take it as it is. And then I need to call out every single city council member who is here tonight and ask you, will you commit, if this fails at the ballot, to instituting it, instituting the changes regardless? 
because this is what's best for the people. And if someone outspends us and it doesn't pass, are you going to do it? So Gorin, um, I don't know anyone else's name. I need you to answer me. Um, second of all, just as far as people showing up to vote, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's unprecedented um, mobilization of the people going on, it, especially in our community. There's been a lot of protesting. We want to see change. I'm not worried about that. Um, third of all, I was just Essex, 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 Essex. He's uh, present. I, I don't know, I think that we might be muted on his screen because he hasn't been looking at anyone this entire time when people ha were talking about dead children. And I find that so offensive as a mother of a one-year-old who's sitting here nursing her, got up at, at seven this morning that you can't even fucking look at people when they're talking about children being murdered. This is for you. We are all talking to you and you're not even looking like, what what is going on? I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The uh, next person we're going to hear from is Lee, L-E-E. -E. I would remind everybody before we hear from Lee, um, although your comments may be heated and impassioned, please refrain from using any um, bad language, any offensive language um, during our presentations. Thank you. Uh, Lee, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Director Navarro, for this meeting. Um, I did, uh, initially I was in uh, calling in to support um, an, un, an, an uh, unaltered version of the El, uh, Evelyn Cheatham um, ordinance, but with after hearing your suggestions, I agree with um, many of them. I support our local organizers and thousands of community members who want to see this on the ballot um, with, with or without the modifications at this moment. And I really want to see the Board of Supervisors acknowledging that we, the community, has been working in support of the local organizers for the last two months when the entire country is asking for for accountability and it is time it is way past time as so many people have said it is so way past time people all people need to be safe in this community and all people are not safe and if you don't hear that you're not listening please put this on the ballot thank you i yield my time Thank you. I'll take uh, one more public comment before we hear from our remaining panelists. And again, we will take more public comments after the discussions. Um, I do see there's an individual, Jana Blunt. Jana Blunt. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, my name is Jana Blunt. I work for our county clerk, recorder, assessor, registrar, our voters office. And I'm also the president of SEIU 10 to 1's Sonoma County Chapter, the largest labor union of the largest employer of our county. Those who've proposed that our community members of color don't support Evelyn's ordinance are either not paying attention or trying to mislead. The Evelyn Cheatham ordinance was created from the principles of NACOL, a group created by black people striving for oversight. Evelyn's ordinance not only relies on the work of a wide variety of black and indigenous activists of color, but it's also inspired by our many local activists of color with whom Iolero directly worked during Jerry Threat's tenure as director. They spent a tremendous amount of time, energy, and money on researching best practices, models of accountability, policy, legal frameworks, and how best to implement them in our local community. The charge that there's no input to Evelyn's ordinance by people of color is patently false and offensive. With month after month of canceled meetings, throttled public input, and CAC members resigning in disgust, I'm afraid that the tactics to delay and dissuade our Board of Soups from agreeing to place the ECO on November's ballot unchanged are going to succeed. I'm afraid for my black and brown family members and friends. Several of their faces are on my laptop screen right now. I miss you, Alma, I'm so proud of you. I'm afraid that Susan Gorin, David Rabbit, 
James Gore and Shirley Zane will take the coward's way out tomorrow because they're afraid of angering the large amounts of powerful and wealthy white bigots in our community. Susan, please be brave for us. The work's been done. I beg you, Susan, move to place Evelyn's ordinance on the ballot unchanged for our loved ones of color. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I do want to hear from a few more panelists before opening up uh, again for more discussion and more public comment. Um, again, I wish I could take all the public comment right now, but uh, we do have some panelists who uh, do need to be heard. And of course, we need to open our discussions as well. Um, let's see, Faith Ross, are you uh, around to uh, speak with us? Hi, Faith. Um, go ahead when you're, uh, when you're ready. Thank you. I am Faith Ross and I live in Petaluma. I have been in Sonoma County since 1975. And um, I'm one of the founding members of Petaluma Blacks for Community Development. The Evelyn Cheatham Artness has a paragraph that requires meaningful, independent oversight and monitoring of the Sheriff's Department increases government accountability and transparency enhances public safety and builds community trust in law enforcement. Such oversight must have the authority and independence necessary to conduct credible and thorough investigations. Now I know that the Alaro has been around for a while, but we also know that it has some deficiencies. I am concerned that we are talking tonight some of us have been on this Zoom um, meeting since 5.30. And so my feeling is that if somebody really was concerned about black and brown comments, they would have brought some of this up before now. But we are at the last minute. And this is, this is, this is shameful on our, whole, um, on our whole county government. And I just wonder how many of our board members are listening to this. Are they, are they out there? I don't know. And also the sheriff, he's list, well, he's there. He may not be listening, but he's there. And so he should be supporting this if his, if his uh, department is doing the things that they should be doing. I am concerned that everything has to be taken care of by what I'm told is August 7th, which is the let to get the ordinance on the November 3rd ballot. I support the Ele Evelyn Cheatham ordinance and I also support the changes that uh, Navarro is recommending to it. I think that strengthens it. And I do not think that uh, the people who support the Ellen, Cheatham, Ellen Cheatham's ordinance will change their minds about it. I think they will support it with the changes. I think that it's important that it be on the ballot for us, especially now, I think, with the awareness of the police brutality and given the time that we're living in right now, it's important that it's, it's there. I, um, the cost of it, the $250,000, I, I think that's a lot less than what we pay in legal fees for some of the cases brought as a result of what the Sheriff's Department has done. So I, you know, I really support that we do this. And I think it's a shame that we've done, we waited until now to bring this up. Thank you, Faith. Uh, the next uh, panelist I'd like to call on is Kareem Sanchez. Kareem? Yes, hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Kareem Sanchez with the North Bay Organizing Project. I'm a community organizer and uh, and part of the reason why I'm a community organizer is why we're here today. Um, in 2013, I worked as a re restorative justice circle keeper and uh, Andy Lopez was supposed to come to my program the day he was killed. Um, the next day I was with uh, Cook Middle School students who were mourning, who were uh, sharing their pain um, and I was with them as they manifested to the sheriff's department. And I was with them when their rage and their anger fell on deaf ears. I was also with them when Eric Gelthaus, the deputy who killed Andy Lopez, was promoted. And we showed up to the sheriff's office offering life and not death. Um, 
so I, I want to say how important it is for me personally, as someone who's experienced the school to prison pipeline, for somebody who's experienced um, the, the discrimination that others have described in uh, uh, the face of law enforcement firsthand, uh, that that there is an uh, accountability and a, a clear way for uh, transparency of the sheriff's department. Um, as a representative of the North Bay Organizing Project, I, I wanted to say that we have studied the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance and we have decided that to support the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance on the ballot. We, we are a organization that values democracy. We, we also understand that there is a, a, a new uh, um, uh, electorate, majority electorate, right? Andy Lopez's peers are now voting age and they haven't forgotten and they will come to the polls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rafael Vasquez? Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Jocelyn Toscano um, and hey, I'm Jocelyn, here. You're good, you're good. Uh, it does have his name. Um, so I'm here representing Metro the SRJC and we have a little letter that we wrote um, together. So we as Metro the SRJC support the Evelyn Chinam uh, Pop Ordinance to bring justice to the community. Oops, sorry, I moved a little bit. To the community in the following forms. We want to be clear that the following three items um, that were talked about before are additions to the Evelyn Chinam Ordinance. Um, after consulting with our members, we have agreed to support in removing the requirement for media coverage in order to obtain video recordings from the officer's cameras. Uh, make videos more accessible to the public on the IO Little website for transparency, like others have mentioned. Uh, we move to require that any officer with questionable his history be put immediately on the Brady list, not after three strikes. Um, these three requirements are to be met for us to for us to support it being put on the ballot on the November election. Um, this is nothing new to us as the Metro SRGC has supported and organized the largest protest in regards to police brutality when the assassination of Andy Lopez occurred in 2013. Thank you for listening and for your time as well. Thank you, Jocelyn. Is uh, Ku Yang Vigil uh, available for comment uh, or presentation? Hi, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll be quick, you know, just uh, thank you again for having me on the panel today. I just wanted to say that I support the EPO onto the ballot. Let the folks, um, you know, our community vote. Uh, and um, I, I support also um, Navarro's, the, the director's uh, changes, um, modifications for the ECO as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the last presenter before we open it up to um, brief public comment before our discussion, uh, Jerry Tao. Hi, that'd be me. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Sorry, excuse the um, headphones because my volume wasn't working earlier. Okay. So um, good evening, everybody. My name is Jerry Tao, and um, I work with the APAS program at uh, Santa Rosa Junior College. I want to thank all of you for space uh, to discuss law enforcement oversight in Sonoma County, and specifically in ways to strengthen the Iolero ordinance. So my job at um, Santa Rosa Junior College is to work with the program called APAS, which serves first-generation, low-income, Asian-American, and Pacific Islander students. Now, I want to provide you all a little bit of context, um, because contrary to popular belief, Asian-Americans and Pacific Islanders um, are not your stereotypical model minority. So just to give an idea, from 1977 to 1997, the arrest of Asian American and Pacific Islander youth in the United States increased by 726%. Asian Americans and Pacific Islander prisoner population during the prison boom of the 90s grew by 250%. So we know that the students that we work with live in low-income neighborhoods reeling from generational trauma, historical trauma of war and genocide, experiencing astronomical poverty rates and are, Im are not immune to police brutality. So I just want you to be clear that our, the community that I work with, the community that I belong to, um, lives up close and personal with this. And so with that said, um, today I rise and to support the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance with the Director of Navarro's recommendations. And I also rise today to push and 
push forward this ordinance to the ballot this November. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see somebody, um, I wanna make sure we didn't forget anybody. Are there any panelists or presenters here that I did not call on? Um, I believe we did hear from Ruben Scott, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, Kim McNeil, did you have a, a statement or a presentation as well? No? Is, is there any of our presenters who uh, wanted to present or speak that I have not yet given the opportunity? Uh, please raise your hand or, or let me know. Okay, I do see um, uh, Vicki Handron. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, my name is Vicki Handron. I'm an attorney in Sonoma, and um, I work with Alondra, and she um, laid out our position on the matter, but I just wanted to emphasize that um, we do feel strongly that the additions recommended by Director Navarro should be added to the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. Um, I think the additions ultimately strengthen the Sheriff's Office because it, it, they help to build a better relationship with the community. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, I don't know what the best approach is um, to getting the initiative passed, but what we do wanna see is the modified initiative presented in a manner that's most like, likely to succeed. Um, persuasive arguments have been made in, for both approaches, either adoption by the Board of Supervisors or uh, placing the initiative on the ballot. I, personally, I lean towards putting the initiative on the ballot because I do think we're in a unique situation with this upcoming election. Um, I think that there might be higher voter turnout than normal. And I, I do think um, the Black, Live, Black Lives Matter movement has created some momentum that will help move this ordinance along. And I do also think it's important for the people of Sonoma County to be able to have the opportunity to support the initiative. And that's all I've got, thanks. Thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, open up for a few of our public comments uh, before we get into the bulk of our discussion. And I, we're going into hour three. I really appreciate everybody sticking around. Um, after this brief public comment, we are going to uh, open up our uh, discussion to CAC members and our panel uh, regarding our seven questions. Uh, but first, uh, Herman G. Hernandez, uh, if you'd like to give a public comment on the presenters uh, that have spoken so far. Uh, yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So my name is Herman G. Hernandez, and I've served on the uh, Sonoma County Board of Education for the past six years, working with youth focused on equity. Uh, and and uh, I've publicly endorsed the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance since last year. I just want to say a couple things because a lot of the things that I wanted to say have already been said, but Mr. Lopez's idea of doing both is what the county needs right now. The Board of Supervisors needs to take a stand, put in place the interim Evelyn Cheatham ordinance tomorrow with the solid recommendations of Director Navarro and also put the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance on the ballot. We shouldn't even be here discussing this today. This is a last minute buzzer shot with way too many risks. But my questions to Supervisor Gorn and Sheriff Fessick is, how many more lives have to be lost before you actually do the right thing and make the investments to protect and make our whole community feel safer and heard so that Director Navarro and her staff can actually do her job? Iolero should be receiving every case to audit every incident of force used by sheriff deputies already. The Iolero should be receiving all prior complaints from any involved sheriff deputies. If that was the case, Sheriff Galehouse would not have even been around after he murdered innocent Andy Lopez. Iolero should, have already, should already have direct access to all body-worn camera videos and be authorized to post every body-worn camera where force is being used. I don't even understand how that's not a thing yet. So my recommendation and my, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm very passionate about this issue and I just can't believe we're still talking about this and having a, a listening session about, about this, but please, please support the safety of our community, support the accountability of local law enforcement, support the transparency that our county members deserve we want to know that you actually have our backs. I know what I would do if I was in your shoes. 
pass the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance tomorrow with the solid recommendations of Dr. Navarro and also put the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Okay, uh, next can we hear from uh, Roman Campos? Roman Campos? Hello? Go ahead, yeah, we can hear you. Um, thank you, uh, my name is Roman. Um, I think with the nationwide conversations, it should be undeniable at this point that a uh, BIPOC and impoverished people are impacted the most by law enforcement actions. Um, and I just have a great hesitancy with the supervisors moving, moving forward on this because A, they're of wealth and there's zero ethnic diversity. Um, I don't wanna get into statistics so I don't have a lot of time, but you just don't live the life that we live on a daily basis. And I mean, I'm just at a complete resignation at this point, the board has, almost completely drained my spirit. I've been going to these board meetings constantly. So this is to Carleen, whatever legal issues or shortfalls of the ordinance you find, I'm down for you filling the gaps. But the most important thing is that this goes to the voters. Because with the way the board members' campaigns can be bankrolled by unions, interest groups, the Sheriff's Association, I just will never trust their process. I don't understand this superseding of the democratic voter process at all. It just reeks of corruption to me. So however you can get this on the ballot in November, do it because A, immediacy is key. That's been a main component. It's been far too long, obviously. Um, and B, it's just an accurate representation of the will of the people. It's just fucking democracy. I'm sorry for being profane, but having a handful of rich white people making the decisions that largely impact poor black and brown people that's that's such a tired conversation, and I can't believe we're still having it. So I vote C, and I approve everything Carlene said about amendment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Oh, I'm sorry. We um, Joanne. Joanne is next on my list. Joanne, are you there? Uh, she needs to be unmuted. Hold on. There you go, Joanne. Great. Thank you. With all the powerful statements that we've heard this evening in support, uh, really moving this county ahead to the accountability that was promised uh, probably many times, but certainly recently uh, when Andy Lopez was killed, I don't see that there can be any real issue about the readiness of the voters here in this county to, to stand up. I mean, I live in Sonoma, it's small, but the, the amount of participation in protests, in marches, in standing up and conversing around these issues, even from that small town in this county, was just mind boggling. Um, this is the time the voters are ready, the voters across the country wanna do something. I don't see any difference in the voters in Sonoma County. And I think just hearing the voices from all these many representatives of groups and young people here today, I am confident that people are gonna come out, they're gonna vote, and they're going to demand accountability from law enforcement in this county. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those of you still waiting to give public comment, please don't leave. We do wanna hear from you. However, at this point, I do want to open up our um, main discussion and our main uh, dis panel discussion with our uh, community advisory council. Um, specifically, I'd like to go through um, the seven questions that Carlene presented and that it seems like we're really dealing with as far as the amendments, if any, are to be made to the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance. Um, so just going with our uh, CAC and of course, uh, if any panelists wish to be heard on these issues. We are opening this to you as well. Please raise your hand uh, to be a part of these discussions. Um, I'll open up the first question to our CAC as far as uh, do you want to recommend to the Board of Supervisors that the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance, that they modify the ordinance and put it on the ballot or that they modify it and adopt it themselves? Uh, again, talking about modifying the ECO 
uh, and opening it up to our CAC, how do you all feel about a recommendation to either put it on the ballot or uh, for the board to adopt it? Uh, Lorena. I think uh, the people have spoken and the representatives from the organizations that we heard from have spoken as well. And it, I would recommend that we ask the Board of Supervisors that the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance be put on the ballot with the uh, recommendations from uh, Director Navarro included in there as well. Okay, so put, okay. Um, uh, Lorez Bailey, what are your thoughts on that? Hi, Evan, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. It's been um, really good. Well, I was just doing a tally because um, I was very, you know, undecided on this and both sides. So if I go by the, the tally of what we've seen, it seems like overwhelmingly uh, the community supports the ballot with changes, I'm putting it forth as ballot, but with the modifications and recommended uh, changes. And I just also want to say there's been a large call still to have the Board of Supervisors in some way support or endorse or commit to the ordinance. Uh, Alma, um, and, and of course, by the way, one of these questions is if we want to recommend the modifications on the ballot or modifications for the Board of Supervisors, if anybody feels that it should not be modified and, and you want it put on the ballot as is, um, please speak up as well. Um, I know we've heard from a lot of people, um, some who want it un unamended, some who want it uh, with changes. Um, Alma, what are your thoughts on ballot versus uh, adopting it with the board? I really do think that the people have spoken. Almost all the comments want it on the ballot and I'm here to support uh, the public. I'm here to support people of color and, and I think it should be on the ballot. I think um, they've all mentioned that they, uh, they also want the amendment, so Carlene's amendment, so put it on the ballot. But I also really do, um, do like what Juan Lopez and Herman, Her, Hernan, I'm sorry, Hernandez said of doing both. Um, there's no reason why our Board of Supervisors should not be approving this on their own. Um, obviously, from what we've heard, there is a lack of trust with our Board of Supervisors that they will do the right thing for our people of color, our young generation. Um, so I really would like to um, make sure that it is on the ballot, but also urge them to really listen to, to our young people, to our people of color. Is, uh, so I do, I do like the, the two, also strongly recommending it to the Board of Supervisors that they do something about it on their own. So, so uh, you want it on the ballot, but you want the Board of Supervisors as well to in the meantime, do something to strengthen it in the meantime while we wait. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, David, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I believe the, the political climate now is speaking out to have the people vote. So I'd like it on the ballot with the uh, recommendations from the director. And um, I think it's gonna go over well, be overwhelmingly brought in. Yeah. Okay, um, and then uh, Dora, what are your thoughts on ballot versus uh, the uh, recommended for the supervisors to take their own uh, action? Hi everyone, sorry, I turned my camera off, but I have crummy internet. Um, I believe that, well, first of all, I wanna say, my name is Dora Barrera, I grew up here in the Springs area. I am a Latina, I identify as a Chicana, was, have been involved in Mecha since high school and now I'm work for the county under energy and sustainability. But I've been involved in my community for a very long time since I was a teen and I've experienced good and bad, mostly bad with the sheriff's department because this is where I grew up. So this is sheriff's territory. And even as an adult where I've been told things by sheriffs that, you know, you should get involved. Why are you complaining? I am involved and I'm trying to do something, but um, I'm currently a CAC member, just joined this year, and I am doing my best to learn and to listen to everyone here, but I do agree. I like Evelyn Cheatham, and I feel that it does need modifications because it does have loopholes, and um, listening to everyone, I do believe that it should be put on the ballot, but that also the Board of Supervisors should in some way support it. 
Thanks, Dora. And then uh, I'm going to, uh, Jim, I see your hand up, but let me get to uh, Jose, our last CAC member, for some input, and then I'll, I'll get right to you. Uh, Jose, our newest CAC member, what are your thoughts on uh, this question uh, for discussion? Well, it was really intriguing to hear everybody's point of view. Um, I didn't see this as a package of the old uh, ordinance versus the new ordinance. I just see it as uh, what is the best ordinance to put forward. Uh, I do believe that this could be a win-win situation, you know, for the sheriff, for the people, and for public officials. Uh, I do think that uh, my recommendation would be to put it on the ballot, but also this would make uh, the Board of Supervisors, you know, if they can actually adopt it, regardless of what the ballot, it would be a great, it would basically say, you are basically echoing what the people want. Uh, I think this is, these are reasonable. I, I think uh, we're able to, um, uh, we'll put it, uh, take less loopholes out and, uh, and for, so that would be my recommendation. Once again, it would be to put it to a vote, but also to have the local elected officials to also adopt it. Great. Thanks, Jose. Uh, I see a few of our panelists who wish to um, comment. Uh, Jim Duffy, uh, please. So I need to be clear at this point that I'm speaking for me and not for the committee Thank because you. I would have to go back to the committee and go through some things, but I think I think Lorena really hit the nail on the head. There's an overwhelming support for modifying the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance and putting it on the ballot. I do want to say that I hope all of you are realizing, all 148 people that are left, that if you do this, the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance now loses all those endorsements that it had because you're changing the language and we will need all of you to go out and hit the ground tomorrow, right after the board says it, and start gathering endorsements and go to your organizations and start push and need to work on this because a lot of work has been done. And we were all working 24 seven for the past year and a half. And now we got to compress all that into two months. And so many hands will make lighter work. So. Please, um, and also I wanna express some concern over Director Navarro's suggestion that she didn't address tonight, but was in the newsletter to change the focus of the ILRO office to a more activist focus. I worry that that violates the procedural justice tenant of the NACOL's 13 principles. And so how that's worded, I think has to be very carefully done we don't want to come off as an anti-police agency. We need to be a fair and objective agency. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Jim, thanks for your comments. Uh, regarding the endorsements, uh, seeing Evelyn Cheatham and, and how much it has been endorsed, and if it is recommended that it be put on the ballot with the recommendations um, by Ms. Navarro, the, the, the ones that have been discussed, um, I can only imagine that you will get more endorsements when the strengthening allows Iolero to be stronger. Uh, and so, yeah, I would hope that um, once this goes through in, in the way that is recommended, hopefully, uh, that all of those people who supported it once before will, will do so again with these changes. Um, Sylvia Lemus, uh, if you have some comments for, for this aspect of the discussion. Yes, I just want to share that I'm very encouraged to hear a lot of the comments that have been shared today. Um, uh, in 2014 and 2015, I was part of the CAIA task force uh, and the law enforcement accountability that established the recommendation, that set up the recommendation for um, the Iolero, you know, initially they wanted something stronger. And so I think that we're moving in that direction. And so I just want to say that I support um, what's being said today. And I'm just so glad to learn a lot more about what's going on today. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Barbosa Suarez, Su Suero. I apologize again. Suero. I'll get it. Yeah, Barbosa Suero. Um, I want to uh, um, also uh, kind of uh, table on what uh, Jim was saying that the that we do want the Evelyn Chief Administrative on the bill with the recommendations that Kathleen made. I let, or Carlene made. Sorry, Carlene. Um, but specifically the one that she, the ones that she has explained to the public so far. I would feel uncomfortable moving forward with any other um, amendments that don't have public input. Um, personally, and like this is, you know, we're kind of at the final moments here, and this is finally where the communities get an opportunity to speak. So this is very important, and we have clearly a lot to say. The fact that there's still over 100 attendees, almost four hour, four hours in, almost four hours in, 
um, says a lot. We've been waiting to speak for a very long time. And these are just the ones who have the time and the courage and to, to come here and speak. Um, with that said, um, because this is our only opportunity that we've had to speak on this, it breaks my heart to see that Sheriff Essex is not paying attention. It feels like he has muted us because he has been um, called out a few times during public comment and has refused to look at the screen or make any kind of nods or anything. Um, even right now, as I'm speaking about him, he's looking down and is not acknowledging the speakers. Considering that this is about the sheriff's office, I find this highly disrespectful that he's not even willing to listen to the participants. I guarantee that we are muted because he is still, again, looking down at a screen. Plus, we can see in his glasses that he's not even looking at the video footage. So just putting it out there that we don't really have an opportunity to speak as community members and as community members of color. So when our officials and our elected officials don't take this seriously, you know, this is what's creating the distrust in the community. And to finish that off, put the um, Evelyn Cheatham initiative on the ballot with Carlene's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Navarro? Hi, thanks, Evan. Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to quickly follow up. So I did make some other recommendations, and I just want to respond to the community to say that the reason why this was the first meeting that we held, bringing everybody to the table to have a discussion, is because it wasn't until July 14th that the Board of Supervisors ever, ever entertained the idea of putting this on the ballot. It was the first that I had ever heard of it being seriously considered. Before that, the plan was for them to do an ad hoc and have a listening tour and put together an ordinance made from my recommendations, Evelyn Cheatham, and what they heard from the community. As soon as I was told that was the plan, me and the CAC started planning this meeting. This meeting was already planned on July 14th when the board flipped and decided that putting it on the ballot was actually a consideration. So that's why we're stuck here in this pinch tonight, having one night to have this discussion with our community. But um, the only right, so we didn't have enough time to talk about all of the recommendations and loopholes and things that need to be addressed. I picked out the five that I thought were the most important I know this meeting's going really late, but I do just want to say that I've heard other good ideas from other community members and CAC members. So um, there is the prospect we can write something in to allow for additions after something is potentially passed at the ballot. It doesn't always work out as easily as it, it sounds, but we can work something like that in so that we can potentially make other changes to additionally make, strengthen it in the future. Uh, Della Shea, I see your hand up. Uh, any comments regarding this discussion, specifically on ballot versus um, the Board of Supervisors adopting the, the initiatives with modifications? Yes. Um, I'd like to tell everyone that this year, our ballots aren't just votes. We should look at them as grenades. And I think that those people who are not going to be supportive of this we should use those ballots to show our support of them. And I really think that uh, a big part of this is funding as to why it might not be on the ballot because people are concerned about the funding. And I think that that is such an easy, easy result. All you have to do is defund the police and refund the people. It is just that simple. Defund the police and refund the people. Very easy. Thanks, Delachey. Um, okay, you know, for the next parts of our discussion, it seems like- um, I just had a comment. So yeah. I think before we started this meeting, I never thought of the idea that was brought up by um, Ronald and um, then Herman mentioned and then Alma supported of having the Board of Supervisors do their own adoption and also put this on the ballot and I think if that's something that we could incorporate into the letter, if the overall um, community advisory council supports, we should have them take the first step and make some sort of adoption and also uh, let the people know that they can support this as well. And this is what, um, you know, the board of supervisors are doing. And um, I think we should mention that as a recommendation. I honestly had not thought of it until it was brought up in this meeting. I had not either, uh, but I think that we do have uh, what seems like people who are interested in action by the Board of Supervisors in the interim with this being on the ballot in November 
um, as modified as necessary. So uh, yeah, I think we're hearing um, pretty loudly that uh, action is needed sooner rather than later um, with or without a, uh, an amendment. Uh, I'm sorry, with or without a, a ballot proposal, but action is needed sooner rather than later. Um, Kathleen, I see you waving. I can't tell if you're just acknowledge, you're acknowledging statements or if you want to speak. I would like to speak if I may. Please. Uh, I am very heartened by the product, productivity and the, the honest sharing in this meeting. I think we need a whole lot more of this stuff and I'm very glad that it's happening even if it is at the last minute. I, my concern, I mean, there's no question, overwhelmingly, there, we, we here tonight, along with all the other endorsement, uh, or endorsers who are here tonight, want this to go to the ballot now. And I, I think um, asking the Board of Supervisors to modify and put it on the ballot in a day, I think, or a week or whatever, it's, it's virtually impossible. I don't think that they can move that quickly. It's a cumbersome procedure. Um, and that's just the way government works. But no question, it must go on the ballot. With modifications, sure, if they can just wholesale them and write them in, do it. Um, and if they can't, no excuse for not putting it on the ballot as it is. Thank you. Thank you. You know, for these next um, topics of discussion, it seemed it, it seems like we may have, from what we've been hearing, we may not have um, a lot of disagreement, but I, I want to go through them with our CAC to see if, if that really is the case. Um, number two says, do you want to add a provision to the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance that Iolero receive every case for audit where a civil lawsuit is filed against the sheriff's office or do we want to limit it uh, to only the case of quote, media interest? Um, opening it up to our CAC, is there anybody who wants it to remain limited to media interest cases only? Um, if so, please, uh, please raise your hand or, or speak and, and let us know. Okay, so I, I'm not hearing from anybody on the CAC. Uh, is it, I'll just go one by one so I, I, we can make sure as we write our letters. Uh, everybody wants us to recommend to the Board of Supervisors that the um, ordinance be amended to allow an audit with every civil lawsuit that is filed. Um, Lorena, are you good with that? Yes. Okay, uh, Lorez, you good with that? Yes. Alma? Yes. Dora? Yes. David? Yes. And Jose? Yes. All right. Any of our panelists, I see Ronald Lopez, I see your hand up. Um, any comments on this, uh, this topic of yeah. discussion? Yes, I agree with that. Oh, great, great. Are there any other panelists who would like to make their voices heard on this one way or the other um, on civil lawsuits, every, everyone gets audited, or only those where there is, quote, media interest? All of them. Okay, Sylvia Lemus, all of them. Uh, Delachey? All of them, everything they do should be transparent. Okay, great. Um, okay. The next three, uh, the next one is, um, do we want to add a provision or recommend that a provision is added so that the, um, that Iolero receives all prior complaints for deputies all prior investigations, including Brady, which are the uh, exculpatory or the things that are required to be turned over to defense attorneys, um, and the record of discipline for each file. Again, do we want that for all um, Iolero complaints or only those in which there is media interest? Uh, Lorena, all or just media? I would say all. I I actually have my own personal thought about the words media interest being anywhere in the ordinance, but that's just my personal opinion. But yes, I do support everything regardless of whether the media cares or not. Okay. Um, Lorez? I also support it. For no media interest is in some ways irrelevant to me. Okay. Uh, Alma, do you want all prior complaints received as well? All. Okay. Uh, Dora? Yes, I also agree. David? Yes, all previous complaints. 
and Jose. I concur, all complaints. Wonderful. Uh, Ms. Barbosa, I see you raising your hand as well. Thank you. Um, yes, all complaints, and my hand was up for the previous item as well, which I say all as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, if any of our panelists do want to add comments to this, we, we would love to hear from you. Um, if we haven't already, um, just raise your hand on the, on the application. Uh, the next one is if we want to add a provision that Iolero receive for audit every incident of force um, used by a sheriff's deputy, regardless whether a complaint is filed with Iolero. Um, this would apply in cases where there is not a complaint filed with Iolero, uh, but force is documented and used. Do we want those to automatically come to uh, Iolero for audit? Um, is anybody on the CAC opposed to that? Maybe that'll be an easier way to ask it. Does anybody on our CAC oppose Iolero receiving for audit every incident of the use of force? Okay, I'm not hearing from anybody on that. The next one is whether we want to recommend to add a provision that Iolero has direct access to all body-worn cameras and be authorized to post every body-worn camera where force was used on the Iolero website in the interest of transparency. It sounded like this was pretty overwhelmingly sought, um, but if there's anybody on our CAC who feels otherwise or wants to discuss that, um, please uh, let us know. Okay, I'm, I'm not hearing uh, anything in opposition, so it sounds like there is um, a desire to have all body-worn cameras uh, reviewed and posted in the, in the abundance of, uh, in the interest of transparency. Uh, very, just so you know, uh, my, my personal comments, I very much agree with uh, that one. Uh, I think it is extremely important. I would note that other counties do post uh, their body-worn cameras uh, doing the same thing. Uh, when use of force is done, uh, I see no reason why Sonoma County can't do this uh, in every incident. Uh, next is, uh, do we want to recommend a provision that Iolero be authorized to make discipline recommendations to officers being investigated? Uh, is there anybody on our CAC who wants to comment or, or give any information or input on whether we, uh, or Iolero rather, should make discipline recommendations uh, based on the officers being investigated? Any thoughts on that, uh, Lorena? Um, I don't have any personal thoughts from the research that we did. I did see that I think the city of Richmond does something similar. Um, yeah. If this were something that maybe some might see as like having too much power, at least uh, there should be some consideration where we can get a report as to how a deputy or someone in the sheriff's department is disciplined. Um, aside from whatever procedures currently exist um, that we've heard in the community that aren't actually um, what anyone would consider discipline. Um, so something that actually teaches a lesson as to what was done wrong should probably be considered. But if people see that it's, you know, too much power to have authority to recommend something, then I think we should hear the points on that, but I, I personally don't have a disagreement with um, having the ability to provide recommendations because it's not like you're telling the sheriff to do something, you're just recommending what you think should be done. And it's up to them to decide what actually gets done, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it, wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be to actually do the discipline, but yes, it would be for Iolero to be able to recommend what discipline may be appropriate or, or um, called for in, in the particular situation. Uh, Alma, do you have any comments on that one or, or anything to add uh, as far as discipline recommendations? No, I think it, it's a recommendation. Yeah. Us, uh, the C, I'm sorry, the ILA we're giving a recommendation is, is perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, Dora, what are your thoughts on that? I also agree that it's a good addition to that Valencia. David, are you good with having us uh, or Iolero um, discipline, making discipline recommendations as well? Uh, no, I'd be in opposition to that. Okay. 
Well, um, I think it's I think it's overreach and uh, cause some uh, tension and uh, some issues to let the sh let the sheriffs uh, make their recommendation, and then we can see and we can see how that goes. As long as we have information of what the uh, uh, punishment or whatever uh, results were, we can follow up that way. But I don't think we should be making recommendations. As far as the discipline, you you think um, that's kind of where where the um, oversight uh, should end is is the actual disciplining. Yeah, I think that's in house. That's a that's a sheriff's job. We can look at it and um, make some comments about it, but I still think that's in house stuff for the sheriff's department. Okay. Um, what about you, Lorez? Do you uh, feel uh, the same way David does, or do you uh, feel um, that you would like to make discipline recommendations for Iolero? Well, in principle, everything Iolero does is a recommendation. So really, you're just calling out more specific. I think that it could be a tension point and maybe be some concern for some people of being perceived as overstep, even though it's a recommendation. Um, that I could see being a point. Do I think, I don't know if it's so much the recommendation, but I definitely would love to know the results. And I think what happens too is a lot of times we don't know what the disciplinary action is and we don't know what the repercussions are with the action. So for me, I'd actually more transparency about the repercussions of things um, versus recommendation. But I don't have an opposition to it, but I can see it maybe being some people perceive perception just as that uh public comment said that like well wait a minute now it feels like um you're getting into personnel which we are kind of all in personnel and if you think of it about that way but i could see why it might be for some people a, a feeling overreaching even though the word is recommend i agree uh no i, I agree with that very much uh, napoleon reyes uh, what are your thoughts on that as far as the, the issues of discipline i see you raising your hand Yes, so this is purely recommendatory, and it's not unprecedented for civilian oversight to make recommendations as to the appropriate disciplinary action. What I would be concerned about is Ilero to be perceived as a paper tiger. If they do not have that power, what's the point? So I think it's a good recommendation, give it. They're making recommendations. It's recommendations. At least, at the very least, the sheriff's office will have a pulse on what the community feels about what should be the appropriate discipline uh, that should be imposed on the airing deputy. So, so you are okay with the Iolero making recommendations yes. um, because they are just recommendations to be yes. to essentially get the community view, get the Iolero view on on the uh, seriousness of of the uh, incident. Yes, it's not the first. There are about 200 civilian oversight across the United States. This won't be the first civilian oversight that would have that recommendatory power. So I fully support that recommendation by Director Navarro to have that recommendatory powers as to which appropriate disciplinary measure should be imposed. It won't be an overreach because they won't be deciding on the uh, disciplinary measure anyway. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Limas. Um, I think he answered my question. I just didn't know whether one of my questions is what kind of research into NACL best practices about discipline uh, because I just I didn't know whether that's part of the research that had been done uh, if NACL best practices included uh, recommending discipline. So that's just a question I had. But I think that um, Napoleon answered the question. Thanks. Uh, Kiki Barbosa Soero. Hi, yes, I just want to hop on what Napoleon Reyes was saying and um, say that yes, I think that recommendations, I don't think it's an overreach. It is just exactly giving the pulse from the community. This is supposed to be about building a bridge between the community and agencies that are involved. Um, and these agencies tend to be out of touch. Um, and to have our voice in it to at least give um, a critical or at least an objective perspective on what um, on what that should look like, um, I think the community we will feel more heard in that case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tell us, Shelly. Tell us, Shelly, I see your hand up. Yes. I believe that the police sort of policing themselves has never worked. It's never worked. Um, 
what would what would the sheriff do? Put them on a Brady list. Put them on a list. That would be their discipline to be put on a list. Um, I think if you make the Brady list, you should make the unemployment line as well. And the fact that there's even a list is ridiculous. I don't feel comfortable with the sheriff on his own disciplining his officers because to date that has done nothing. And thank you for at least paying attention this time. Thank you, Delache. Uh, do any of our panelists or uh, CAC members have any other ordinance suggestions besides the few um, modifications that we've just discussed? Are there any, because we're essentially going to be sending a letter to the full board later this evening um, where we let them know essentially what our CAC discussion was about, um, how we answered these questions, what amendments we want to see uh, to the ordinance, that we want to see it on the ballot, that we want to see action by our supervisors, perhaps in the interim, but certainly uh, if the ballot is not successful, we want action um, with these amendments and with these uh, ordinance changes. Um, are there any others that we didn't discuss here tonight that people here are, are very passionate about that you'd like to see changed and, and recommended uh, by the CAC to our supervisors? Um, Ms. Barbosa Suero? Hi, yes, I do wanna bring it back to the seven, the topic for discussion number seven about auditing racial profiling data. Oh, okay. I think that this is very important. Um, maybe something does not end in police violence, but there are people who are constantly targeted. There are people who can't go to work without being pulled over. And I think that type of harassment definitely needs to be tracked as well. Um, I also think that anything uh, involving when someone targeted as being a gang member, I feel like that's very racially biased as well, and especially targeting youth, that needs to be involved. And I do like uh, Lorena's uh, provision, the whistleblowing provision. So please um, take that in consideration. Um, and then again, I want to emphasize that should for whatever reason, because we do have coronavirus, we do have other things that are variables as far as um, grassroots ability to do outreach right now. Um, I do want a commitment from our board of supervisors that they will um, implement ch changes to strengthen ILRO should this ballot initiative fail. But most of all, I want them to implement these provisions in the interim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julio Torres, I see you're uh, raising your hand. Thank you. I'll just say really quickly, um, in situations where um, there's people that don't understand English and don't understand it fully, where another officer that can um, speak to them without um, the officer implementing uh, rules as they go, um, because there are none to do that, you know, um, in that case where they can call somebody and translate what is going on. Um, something like that would definitely be beneficial towards our community for sure. Thank you, Julio. Um, so I just wanted to briefly mention uh, the idea that I came up with about the whole whistleblower thing. Um, yeah. My idea is that it's, I guess if there's a way for deputies to report something that they see is being done incorrectly without having to go through their own department. Like I'm not going to report my partner if the person who's going to investigate it is also within the sheriff's department. So I think if there was a way for um, deputies to report any wrongdoing that they think is really significant that should be noted in a confidential sort of way where their name doesn't get put out, um, I think that we should have a process like that where maybe Iolero can intake, um, can take in um, those types of reports on paper. Um, we don't have to track who downloaded a form or something and um, have the director and any assisting staff within Iolero sign a confidential agreement where whatever data they request from the sheriff's department to look into this report that they receive um, has uh, information they can't they wouldn't be able to let anyone know what they're looking into and they would have to write like a report with recommendations as to how that issue could be addressed and the report can be given to the Board of Supervisors the sheriffs 
and the CAC with the names redacted of anyone who comes up in the process. So that way, um, I feel like it's not always, we always think it's law, enforce, law enforcement versus people and people versus law enforcement. But sometimes there's things that people see and you're afraid to speak up because it's your career at stake most of the time. And so to get rid of that mentality, I feel like we need to have like a process where people can trust that their name wouldn't be put out there and we can start addressing some of the issues that um, deputies and others are afraid to point out that are actually going on. And the only reason that this kind of popped into my head was because I saw that the San Diego Board of Supervisors was considering giving their oversight um, group kind of a little bit more power. And I'm also, I'm from the city of Vallejo and there, it's not county, but their police department is having a lot of issues with their police officers association and a lot of things that are happening internally with evidence and how officers are acting. And if you see something that's really wrong, I feel like someone should speak up about it because then you have people just dead on the street somewhere and everyone gets to see it and no one's addressing the issues because we don't know what they are. We're not in the sheriff's department or in the police department, we're just regular people. So if there's a way to protect um, deputies and uh, try to address the problems, I think we should um, do that. And I made up some process that um, we can probably detail later on if that was something that people wanted to consider. I just wanna say, Lorena, I love that. And I really do support that fully. And then back to like the suggestion I said around collecting this uh, demographic data. The truth is we all know our experiences. I mean, that's uh, empirical for ourselves, but we don't really have data around who is stopped, who is arrested, who forces you to get. We don't have that racial demographic data. And that's really important too, because you know we need the quantitative and the qualitative experience um, you know, around that. We know what the experience has been. We also don't have the true data to show what the, that really looks like. So um, if I don't know if that's necessarily a policy, so I don't know if it's a recommendation, but it is something that I think is really important to be thinking about, if not for this time going forward. Yeah, um, uh, this is Evan Zellig. I, I really like the idea of the whistleblower provision for police officers. Um, I have a feeling we would, we would probably see a lot of police officers coming forward if they didn't fear the um, blue, the, the blue line, if you will, uh, I think we'd see a lot more police officers coming forward if they could do it anonymously, where they would not have to fear repercussions by their fellow officers or their supervisors um, or their department heads. Um, there's a lot of police officers who see bad things happening and don't say anything. Um, because if they say something, more bad will happen to them within their departments uh, and and um, it, it causes problems for them. And I would really love to see a, some way where um, officers, the good officers can step forward and report the bad ones without bad things happening to the good ones. Uh, I think it's a great idea, uh, as well as um, compiling racial data. Why that hasn't been compiled um, up till now is, is beyond me. Uh, it's very important. We need to see exactly how um, the people of color in our community are being treated by the police, whether it is a lawful non-incident contact that goes as planned uh, or whether it's a use of force incident. I think uh, all of our racial data does need to be compiled. Um, I, I agree with that as well. Um, Ms. Barbosa, I see your hand up as well. Yeah, yes, just um, speaking on um, the racial profiling data, I think we also need to audit instances where law enforcement interactions are made without accommodations for primary language, like Julio was saying. Um, also with including sign language, um, I know that our population with disabilities is often overlooked and people of color with disabilities are often, and mental, um, mental health um, struggles are often um, experiencing much more violence than, than those who are uh, neurotypical or et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Duffy. Two really quick points. One, uh, RIPA data, the Racial Identification Profiling Act data, was committed to be released by Sheriff Giordano on an annual basis at the uh, December 2018 annual report, and Sheriff Mark Essick has backtracked on that commitment. 
So you want to go back and look at that hearing for those who didn't pay attention then and hold the sheriff to the sheriff's office commitment. And secondly, you've got a whole bunch of public participants who have been sitting with their hands up for a long time. So I think you should. Yeah, we're going to get to all of our public comments. We just certainly wanted to get this information out. Um, it sounds like we have uh, had information. It, it sounds like our letter will be um, recommending, of course, the putting it on the ballot, but taking action uh, as soon as possible before then, if possible. Uh, with the modifications uh, recommended by Director I, um, Navarro, uh, as well as with the additional recommendations that uh, that the Board of Supervisors also look into um, strengthening Iolero by uh, having more uh, sheriff's racial data provided to Iolero, um, as well as perhaps a whistleblower hotline or something with Iolero where police officers can report others uh, without consequence and anonymously or, or some method by which they can do that. Um, I, I do want to take our last two um, presenters who have their hands up and then get to our public comments. Um, Ku Yang Vigil. Yes, um, so I just wanted to go back to when Director Navarro was presenting earlier this evening. Um, along with these recommendations, I definitely um, think that we should definitely put resources and funding support Dr. Uh, you know, Navarro and the, and the um, Iolero. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point um, that I support that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the last hand I see up, it says defund police. I don't know if that's a change name or, but defund police. Uh, um, my question is also for, not just with the sheriff, but for the board too. Um, I'd like to know when you put this in writing, how long it's going to take them to put this stuff in effect? Like, I don't, I don't want this to pass and it just, you know, passes. I, I like that in writing some black and white, when this is actually going to go into effect and for them to be held uh, with the accountability as to when, you know, when it'll be in effect. That's one thing. And uh, my question too is, the sheriff, is he going to speak at all tonight? Is he going to address anything tonight or he's just listening or I mean, ignoring or whatever he's doing at the moment? At this point, um, Sheriff Essek is present here on the Zoom meeting. Uh, if he does wish to make any comments, he may. Uh, at this point, he has not indicated he wishes to do so. Well, then my question is directly to the sheriff. I'd like to know how he feels about everyone wanting some changes and Alireo being over him as far as him being able to police his own police and when is he going to clean up his own swamp? I'll uh, open it to Sheriff Essek if he does wish to uh, respond at this point. I don't see, um, I don't see his hand up or, oh, he is unmuted. Great. Well, I, I <clears throat> as I stated before uh, earlier tonight, um, I'm here to listen. <clears throat> I've heard all the comments, um, been taking notes on them, um, and I uh, appreciate all the comments that are coming in. Uh, I don't think I can address them all tonight, um, but I'd be happy to uh, come back and discuss more uh, with the CAC, uh, any questions that you might have in the future. Thank you, Sheriff Essek. Uh, I am sure we will want to do that in the future. Um, I am going to open it up now to public comments. Uh, before I get to those who are raising their hands, I do want to put into the record that we have received a written public comment from the Sonoma Valley Democrats. We received a letter um, specifically where they are uh, recommending the um, changes that uh, Director Navarro has recommended um, as part of their recommendations uh, for Iolero uh, strengthening. Um, so I do have the letter from the Sonoma Valley Democrats. We also received a letter from, excuse me, uh, Sonoma Valley Resistance, co-signed by 37 individuals. Uh, we will provide those letters, uh, as well as a letter we've received from Rhonda Feindling, uh, second chance counselor at SRJC. We will provide those public comment letters with our letter uh, to the supervisors when we send that uh, to them. Um, I want to open this up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. This hi. is Melanie. Oh, hi, Melanie. Um, we also received four letters in our um, email box 
uh, the CAC email box, mm -hmm. uh, basically stating the same thing. Uh, we want the we want the measure on the ballot. I don't know if any of these people are present here in the meeting. I looked in the attendees list and I didn't see them. So if they've changed their mind, I don't know. Um, but Mary Louise Jaffrey, Lana Brewer, Justine Epstein, and Marsha Dupree. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now gonna open up our uh, meeting to our final public comments. Uh, public comment will be restricted to two minutes each. Um, at this point, we're gonna open it up. I apologize if you've been uh, raising your hand for a long time. I'm only gonna go in the order that I see on my screen. I don't know what order that puts uh, people up in, but I'm gonna call you in this order. Um, starting with Joe Bell, J-O-B-E-L-L, -L, Joe Bell. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, my name is Jolie and I'm a longtime uh, resident of Sonoma County. And I wanna first address uh, Sheriff Essek. I, I was very deeply saddened by your inability to listen to Elaine, an 80 year old woman who was asking you to imagine what, your, what it would be like if your child was murdered on the streets. And you couldn't even acknowledge or look at the screen when the community is sharing their pain with you. This is the community that you serve. We're asking you for the lives of our black people and other people of color in our community to not take this personally, but to rather embrace it and show us that you care for them and have nothing to hide by having a transparent relationship with those you are sworn to protect. I have heard many young speakers tonight tell you their experience with police brutality, use of force, and the school to prison pipeline. They are not wrong. Sheriff Essek just said a few weeks ago in one of these meetings that he runs his jail like a hotel where the vacancy sign is always on. This is not what we want from our sheriff's department in Sonoma County. Yes, we would like to see the ordinance on the ballot with the amendments that the Director Navarro suggested, especially and especially a few certain things that I will mention, but also if it does fail at the ballot, which I don't believe it will, I would like the board to publicly say that they will promise to strengthen Iolero anyways. The Sheriff's Department has spent $9.1 million on litigation and settlements for lawsuits, lawsuits of use of force, torture, injury, etc., since 2013, when Andy Lopez was murdered. This money could be redirected to strengthen police oversight as well as other community programs to help eliminate the perversion of law enforcement's engagement with our community. A few of the amendments that I especially want to mention are the need to adopt um, the, that Ayalero has access to every single use of force case so that the Sheriff's Department is not picking and choosing which ones they are going to pass along. This is not going to work. Also, all body footage cameras should be turned over to Ayalero. We need to expand staffing for Ayalero to be able to handle reviewing these body cameras and any new tasks tasks brought on by the strengthening. Thank you. Every and again, I apologize if we have to cut you off. Uh, public comment is limited to two minutes. Uh, Colin Metcalf, Colin Metcalf. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hey, wait, let me put in my headphones real quick. All right, you can still hear it? Yes. Okay, uh, I just want to echo what a lot of other people have said. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you guys are voting in support of the people um, and backing us up on what we've said. Uh, this is probably one of the first government meetings that I've been to where uh, you've actually responded in support of us. And I just want to thank you and congratulate you for that, for actually listening to us. Um, I would say yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was expecting to comment before you guys voted on it, so I, I don't really know what to say now, but um, yeah, I'm glad that happened. Uh, to the Board of Supervisors members who are still in the meeting, I don't know, you might have all left at this point, but uh, we'll see you again tomorrow at 8.30. I hope to see them vote in support of what uh, CAC has recommended. Uh, I would tell the police the same thing that they tell us often, which is that if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. Uh, you should be as transparent as possible, and I hope that strengthening ILRO achieves that goal. Um, thanks again for listening to us. That's it. 
Thank you, Colin. Um, next, going to Morgan. Uh, no last name listed. Morgan. Go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go, Morgan. Hi. Uh, my name's Morgan. I've been a resident of Sonoma County for over 30 years. Um, I raised my hand after the first group of speakers, <laughs> but I stuck around. Um, I'm glad. So my, my recommendation based on a lot of other people um, wanting the board to, if the vote, if the ballot vote fails to um, pass the ordinance anyways, was for them to flip the script. They have the ability tomorrow to adopt this ordinance. I think they should. Uh, they can also put it on the ballot. I think they should. Um, if the vote passes, they can supersede that original ordinance with the ballot ordinance and let that, you know, let that take precedence uh, so that it can't be easily uh, watered down in the future. Um, I really hope that tomorrow the supervisors and the sheriff department act to encourage. Um, I think the sheriff should support this ordinance. Um, if, you know, we adopt these recommendations, which I think we should, and we lose all these endorsements, I really call on the sheriff's department to be the first endorsement for the ordinance. I, I think that, you know, you should want to work with us, the community, to make your department better, to protect the people here. Um, I also just wanted to say that I hope that the board moves forward with this tomorrow because there are people who can't vote for this uh, due to you know their past, criminal past, due to their citizenship status. Um, and I, my, my initial question uh, was similar to Delache, I just asked this question, um, but what does the timeline look like to start enacting these, these changes uh, based on whether it's a ballot vote or the board approves it tomorrow? So if the board is able to adopt it tomorrow, how quickly could Iolero get working under the new ordinance? And if we had to wait for the vote in November, when could we start working under that new ordinance? Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. The next person I'm going to call on is Evan Phillips. Evan Phillips. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Thank you for uh, taking my comment. Uh, first, I would just like to point out that I think it's very important how this is messaged and framed uh, both to the sheriff and the law enforcement community, the board of supervisors and the community at large that this is not necessarily a statement or an accusation of guilt or any sort of anti-cop sentiment. It shouldn't be met with any such resistance. This is strictly uh, a restoration of credibility to the points that other people have made um, if there is no misconduct to hide, there should be nothing to fear about this. And this is about building better trust and repair moving forward. Um, it's an opportunity. It would be great if the sheriff specifically would also endorse it. I know that some of the Board of Supervisors, who I won't use by name, um, have considered it a waste of time and off the record have called it a waste of time and a waste of money, which is disheartening. And part of that is, is it, it's not funded enough. So there's other considerations I'd like to point out. Uh, I think something that uh, CAC should look into is maybe potential recusal from some board members based on their relationships that can be tracked uh, you know, through union uh, relationships and, and the, the economic benefit and the, the revolving door that exists there with that. I'd also like the board to make a recommendation, not that this is just a, a county, but to also seek out partnerships with the cities within the county uh, other uh, amendments that could exist could be fixed budgets amount. Uh, you know, asking for 1% of the total budget from the sheriff is something that is, is not exorbitant at all. So that should be re-examined. I know they I gave the impression that they couldn't do that, but that's not true. Uh, another very specific thing I think you need to look at, aside from the racial profiling data, is the time of arrest. Because of that relationship that I just pointed out between the police unions and some board members, there's some questionable parts about that contract. If you look at the time of arrest, when people are closing their shifts and a lot, the amount of money that we spend on people, it seems I wouldn't be surprised if we had an audit and Iolero had a purview of such information. Thank you, Evan. Yeah. Thank you, Evan. I apologize for cutting you off. I, I do appreciate the comments. We, we are trying to get to as many people as possible this evening. Uh, Samra Tekle, Samra Tekle, again, apologize for mispronouncing uh, your names. Uh, Samra or Samra? 
surprisingly, you got it correct. All right, thanks. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, yeah, no one's ever actually done that. So, um, I wanted to continue on the, uh, the point of like, you know, turning in all body cam footage over to Iolero. I think that if police ever make the effort to block body cameras, that that should be ruled as a crime because essentially they are attempting to block evidence. And that is huge. That should immediately be like identified as a crime, an intentional crime at that because they are trying to prevent, you know, legal, you know, legal, like actual justice from being held. And I feel like that would be extremely important to add to um, this whole like, measure and whatnot, that we should prevent them from being able to you know, cover up their body cameras. And continuing on this, I feel like we need to make more efforts in order to have like preventative measures of the police enacting violence among people. Because for as fantastic as Iolero, as what we are doing is, it's still not going to prevent the, sh like the sheriff's department or any other police officer from enacting violence. Therefore, um, if we were able to divide the, like, you know, the sheriff's department up for handling different issues, that would be fantastic. And I also like to go on the fact that um, I believe that the sheriff should work with us or should be in full support of this. I recall um, a certain speaker talking about how they expected opposition from the, from the sheriff, which is horrible because we are both attempting, if they were going for the safety, if they're trying to fulfill their job of providing safety toward the community, then they should have no problem with what Iolero is doing. Because if they had nothing to hide, then they should not be opposed to these measures of providing clarity, that are meant to provide clarity, that are meant to provide um, transparency. If there was no problem with their department, then this shouldn't be a problem. And um, on that note, I believe that Iolero should- Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the next public speaker, uh, Robert Edmonds. Robert Edmonds. I can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. So we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. We have to place the ECO on the ballot tomorrow. The idea that BIPOC people and underserved members in the community have not weighed in on effective oversight in, this Sonoma, in Sonoma County is inaccurate. When SESO deputies killed Jeremiah Chass in 2007, when Ryan George was left to die of sickle cell anemia because the sheriff failed to provide medication in 2007, when Richard DeSantis in 2007 and Jesse Hamilton in 2008 were killed by SRPD during mental health crises, we marched in the streets, a broad human spectrum demanding true independent oversight of law enforcement. When Andy Lopez was gunned down by Deputy Gellhouse in 2013, thousands of people of color and of all colors again marched on the county center to demand law enforcement oversight with teeth. As the vice chair of the resulting CAIA task force, also a member, hello? Oh, also a member of the law enforcement accountability subcommittee that created ILRO. We heard hundreds of hours of testimony from intersecting communities across the county, from experts in oversight, from law enforcement leadership and local officials. Sheriff Essick was the only one of 21 members of that task force to vote against all of the recommendations of the task force, yet ran on his street credentials as a member of that task force. However, the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance is very much in keeping with the promises of the CAIA task force and offers much more robust oversight, subpoena, and investigative authority than the current model. I appreciate and approve of Director Navarro's amendments, but I fear we don't have time for the perfect wordsmithing before tomorrow's board meeting, unless, of course, Director Navarro has authored an amended version for submittal. We must place the ECO on the ballot tomorrow in some form. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kimberly Coleman, uh, you're up next. Kimberly Coleman. Go ahead, Kimberly. Kimberly, can you hear us?
Kimberly, are you able to hear us or should we uh, go on and we'll come back to you? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, hello, my name is Kimberly Coleman. I am a student at SRJC and a lifelong Sonoma County resident. Um, I'm just here to say, to say that I stand with everything Kimmy Barbosa Solero and others have proposed and supported. I'm here to urge that the Evelyn Sheetham ordinance is put on the November ballot with Carlene Navarro's recommended modifications. If it's passed on the ballot by voters, voters can change and amend it on future ballots rather than leaving it to the mercy of the Board of Supervisors. And also Iolero should have um, should be allowed to recommend punishments and audit racial profiling data, and this should be included in the Evelyn Sheetham initiative. And these are just a couple of the recommendations that I wanted included along with um, Navarro's recommendations. And uh, thank you for your time, and I yield my time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person we have up is Tavi or Tavi uh, Tornado. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Tavi, and I am co-founder of Love and Light. Um, I was born and raised here in Santa Rosa, and I grew up in Roseland, where I was student body at Roseland Elementary, Cook Middle School, and LCL in high school. Um, I just wanted to echo what Kimmy had proposed, and also that ECO needs to be on the ballot with the modifications that Navarro had made to it, and um, along with um, Along with that, one minute, I just want to read something off of the SRPD website stating their vision and their mission statement. Um, the vision of the police department, the community will believe that the Santa Rosa Police Department is a proactive, progressive, and professional organization committed to making Santa Rosa a safe place to live, work, and play. And under that, it says accountability to each other, to the organization, to the profession, to the community. It states with us integrity and ethical behavior. Do the right thing at the right time. It's the core of everything we do, personal and professional pride. And I'm, I'm echoing this from the SRPD website because I want you all to do the right thing. Take accountability. And part of ECO is to provide accountability and doing the right thing by the community. And that is the, and also I'm a single mom. So I, I'm just going to support ECO being on the ballot. And um, I just want to call out the SRPD and say that, you know, if anything is the right time, right now is the right time to support this ordinance. And, in terms of supporting your community. And also I am proud Khmer, first generation American, and I am a proud brown woman from Roseland. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person we have up, <clears throat> excuse me, is Bailey. Bailey. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Hi, um, I would just like to echo uh, past statements of pretty much everybody that's spoken tonight um, in favor of the ordinance. Um, I'm in full support of putting the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance on this November ballot uh, with or without modifications. Uh, this needs to happen and should have been done years ago. Uh, the Sheriff's Department definitely needs to be held accountable for decades of human rights violations. And uh, yeah, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David, no last name. David. Hi there. I'm a resident of Sonoma County. I'm in support of the ECO and the amendments brought forth by Carlene sound like good additions. I second Ronald Lopez and others suggestions that the board adopt the ordinance while we wait for the county to vote on it come November and to commit to strengthening ILRO regardless if the ballot measure fails. It's horrendous that anybody would be against police oversight as it benefits not only those who our police officers are supposed to protect, but also those police officers who desire the support and trust of their community. I would like to see Sheriff Essek tonight here in this meeting voice his support for the ECO. 
If you want to rebuild trust with the community, Sheriff, start now. Support this ordinance on the record tonight. If you remain silent, we'll interpret that as your support for the status quo and the trust you desire from the community will be diminished further. I, remield, <laughs> I yield my remaining one minute and two seconds to Sheriff Essek to respond directly to my comment. Thank you, David. If uh, Sheriff Essek does wish to um, make a statement, I'll let you know if the hand is raised. Uh, moving on to Susan Lamont, please. Susan Lamont. First, Colin, who spoke earlier, you should come to another CAC meeting. You'd be profoundly disappointed because the meetings have been cut from two hours to an hour and a half, and you have no input whatsoever, and there used to be a lot. So regarding body camera footage, it's a little more complicated than presented because there are actually victims who do not want the footage released. So I'm just asking for some consideration that there needs to be some way to consider that. And um, since we're talking about the uh, modifications that Carlene suggested, um, the ones that she has mentioned tonight sound good. I would suggest that we not include any that have not been discussed since we have been talking about the need for discussion. So the other thing that concerns me is um, uh, no one has yet answered the question, can an amended version of the Evelyn Cheatham ordinance be put on the ballot by August 7th? The entire conversation means nothing if we don't have the answer to that question. And I haven't seen it anywhere. And I sure hope the question will be answered at the meeting tomorrow. The other thing I, want to know about you've already voted on it but it strikes me that the standard that incidents that result in civil lawsuits is not better than incidents that result in media interest is prob you know not definitive because there are probably as many incidents that don't result in lawsuits as there are that don't result in media interest so it strikes me that both of those should be there not just one thank you Thank you, Susan. Uh, Omar Paz. Omar Paz. Paz. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Paz. I'm a former member of the Community Local Law Enforcement Task Force, former member chair of the Community Healing and Engagement Committee, former club member of many of the groups that have presented today at Santa Rosa Junior College, including the Metra Black Student Union, the Student Government. Tonight. I would like to express my support for adopting the level and Sheetham ordinance with Director Navarro's recommendations and this recommendation that the Board of Supervisors adopt this in the interim and uh, adopt any a clause that will allow the ballot to read um, that any further changes should only be to strengthen it post election. Um, just commenting on uh, that from a more of a historic perspective um, in this meeting, you know, I'm, I'm very heartened to see and, and just want to first and foremost say thank you to everyone who is still on this call on the CAC to the sheriff to everyone who is still here four hours in your work is seen and it is deeply felt and I am grateful for it. Thank you. Um, one, I just want to say one quote to something that's kind of been driving process through me for this work, aside from the memory of Andy Lopez and all those whose lives have been lost. Utopia lies at the horizon. When I draw near by two steps, it retreats two steps. If I proceed 10 steps forward, it swiftly slips 10 steps ahead. No matter how far I go, I can never reach it. What then is the purpose of utopia? It is to cause us to advance. And we are by no means near any form of utopia when it comes to trust and engagement with law enforcement that deeply understands and respects the community's issues that have been brought to light in the many years that have led us to this moment. However, this discussion is one of those steps. Tomorrow's meeting will be another one of those steps. Enacting the ordinance on the ballot will be another one. And each one that we take together is a victory for the community and the victory for all. And I would just encourage you all to continue doing this work. Thank you very much. Uh, the next individual is Ashley, no last name, uh, Ashley.
Ashley, are you available? Hello. Hi, Ashley. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Ashley. I am a Sonoma County resident. I am demanding you put the Evelyn Chet, Chet, fuck, cheat him on the ballot, sorry, with the revisions recommended from Carlene Navarro. It's time for the people to stand up and speak for themselves. Even though we don't trust those who are on the board, I am still demanding that they still adapt the Ayolero if it fails at the ballot. I, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Angel Washington, Angel Washington, I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly. It's on jail. You said it close enough, but um, hi, I'm a single black mother in Sonoma County, and I can say I deeply connect to the um with the homeless community. I'm a houseless mother, so I'm often moving from hotel to hotel, and I get harassed by the police a lot. So I'd like to say, um, along with the whistle thing, oh, I support the Evelyn Chapman thing being you know, put up there, if the board could adopt it before, and also with some changes. Like I, like I was saying, though, with the whistle thing, who are the people that are being harassed to call, or the, like the bystanders standing around supposed to call when you don't feel safe by the police or something is happening? You know what I mean? There should be some, some way for the community or the person being harassed to be able to contact someone above the police to step in, because I listen to Navarro's definition of de-escalation the other in the last meeting and it was terrifying you have to escalate before you de-escalate I'm not sure if the sheriffs you know um operate on the same methods but that's scary you know what I'm saying so if we could just have some kind of way where the community can also whistle that would be awesome thank you I yield my time thank you uh the next person I see is Charlotte Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, okay. My name is Charlotte Borg and I'm a longtime resident of Santa Rosa. Um, since this has already been approved and thank you for that, uh, my statement is now directed toward any supervisors remaining on the call. Um, as is evidenced by the outpouring of support for this ordinance, Iolero has not been able to function as intended in its existing state. We need more transparency from all law enforcement in Sonoma County and we have to make it impossible for law enforcement in this county to skirt accountability. Please move forward with putting the ECO on the ballot and allow us to strengthen civilian oversight of law enforcement. To echo earlier speakers, if the board cared to pass things like this themselves, they would have done so a long time ago. I would add my voice to those who do not trust the board to be responsible in maintaining Ilero's effectiveness if they only adopt this ordinance, but I'm in support of them demonstrating their support, <laughs> saying support a lot. Um, I, they should put an interim order into effect is all I'm saying. Um, all of directors, Nav Director Navarro's amendments that were discussed tonight should absolutely be added. Um, moving forward, something else we need to look at is adding additional staff and funding for Iolero. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Michael Titoni. Michael Titoni. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Michael. Um, I'm white, I'm of British Isles, German, Italian, various descent. Um, I just wanted to say that I feel like um, we definitely should have the ordinance on the ballot. Um, I understand that especially, I think white progressives have a tendency to overestimate the, um, the level of, of uh, the, underestimate the level of white supremacy that exists in the county, but I also think that um, it's, there's just not gonna be a better time. There's not gonna be a, it's, it's just not gonna get easier. We have to try now. We have to always be trying to, to get these things passed. And I, if the board you know, adopts the ordinance, it's, it's just gonna be possible for them to change it or alter it. And you know, it's not gonna be real independent oversight. We need something that they can't just change on a whim. Um, and I really wish that we could have like a, a debate about a, a, re, a long, more long 
you know, responsive debate about the, the, leg the legal aspects of this because, um, you know, there's a lot of things I'd like to add to the ordinance, such as abolish the police, but um, you have to be strategic, you have to work with what you, what you, what you can do. So for me, um, I feel like, you know, I really wish we could, we could have that debate. It's, a, it's very late though, and you know, tomorrow's the meeting. So at this point, you know, I think we should, I think we should adopt the ECO. Um, I'm, I'm open to changes that people want to put on it and it should be put on the ballot for sure. And yes, of course, the Board of Supervisors should adopt it regardless. Thank you, Michael. The uh, next person we have is Emma. Emma? Hi. Thank you, Emma. Uh, hi, my name's Emma and I'm a Santa Rosa lifetime citizen and voter. Um, I want to thank you all for hosting this session and please implement the, uh, the strengthening measures for Iolero as quick as possible. I honestly think Sheriff Essek is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I think he is hiding his allegiance to more conservative supremacists and toxic values to put on a good face. His words simply do not match his actions. And I know a lot of you know this in your heart. He knows that the Iolero program will expose these shortcomings, which is why the Sheriff's Department has attempted to put so many roadblocks up against this program. What are you so afraid of? And <laughs> and don't think we forgot the helicopter that you borrowed. Other than that, it's heartening to hear you all discuss this issue legitimately and expand on these topics with empathy. If you consider yourself progressive, if you actually care about this community, you will be brave in this moment. These are the times when your job actually matters. I want to echo what Evan was saying about checking timestamps and exploring how much overtime is being paid to officers, making more arrests towards the end of shifts. And as we've seen in Vallejo, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, this is not issues of momentary discretions. These are systems and cultures ingrained into the nature of policing. The amount of money the Sheriff's Department spends on litigation shows that Sonoma County is no exception to the disturbing trends of violence and the subjugation within law enforcement Enforcement agencies. Thank you for this discussion, and I hope you all do everything within your power to strengthen this initiative. I yield my time. Thank you. It looks like we've got three uh, individuals remaining. After these three, we are going to stop public comment. Um, it's just um, our, our presenters have been here for more than four hours, and uh, we're going to get to, um, we still need to present our letter to the board and, and draft that tonight. Uh, two people left, uh, Chris Hansen. Uh, Chris? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm supportive of the ECO, but I've got to say, Sh Sheriff Essex, I mean, you've made a dog and pony show of the current ECO. It's not really uh, what it was supposed to be. I mean, she, 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 she's a dog and pony to you now. She has no power. All you do is show her around and say, look, I'm doing something. You're not actually doing anything, but showing off that you're not doing anything. Like, this is appalling. I really think you need to consider how you're acting and look at the community, not yourself. So, Ms. Navarro, I'm sorry that you've been treated this way. I really, really appreciate all the work that you've done. And... It's, it's appalling that you've been undermined by Sheriff Essex. It really is. So once again, Mr. Navarro, I really, really appreciate your time and your effort. And I'm appalled by Mr. Essex's performance and his actions. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. The uh, last individual, there's two more. Um, uh, Elizabeth, I see you just put your hand up. We uh, are un unfortunately not able to get the duplicate co public comment tonight, just given the number of people we have. Um, I'm going to call on two more. Uh, Libby, it's Libby with a lots of bees. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good. I just want to talk about how we should support the Evelyn Truth Ordinance as is. I do also appreciate Carlene Navarro's uh, addendums to the ordinance as well. I think it'd be good to be, have that on the ballot. I think that the lack of law, law enforcement oversight has been egregious and really disrespectful to the community. 
Um, this could have been happening a long time ago, and it's disappointing that it's taken so long for people to be heard. I'm grateful for this time that uh, we've been given. I'm grateful for Carleen Navarro for having this meeting. I'm grateful to the panelists that have been discussing this, and I really hope that the board adopts this thing and pushes forward the amendments that it needs to give Iolero the teeth that it requires. Um, this is your chance to actually show your community that you care about us. So do the right thing. Thank you very much. And our last public comment for the night is uh, listed as Sarah. No last name listed. Uh, Sarah, please go ahead. Hi, Essek, are you listening? Could you just nod your head or maybe put a little thumbs up? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so um, I just want to say deeply from the bottom of my heart, fuck you. I yield my time. Okay, um, that is the conclusion of our uh, CAC meeting for today. I just wanted to confirm with our CAC members that uh, we will be writing a letter tonight. I will be drafting it to our Board of Supervisors where we are um, recommending that the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance be placed on the November ballot with the recommended modifications and additions uh, recommended by uh, uh, Director Navarro. Uh, in addition, we will let the Board of Supervisors know that we would also like to see considerations for the audits of racial profiling information um, as part of the Iolero ordinance, as well as um, perhaps a whistleblower provision that allows law enforcement officers to file complaints uh, without repercussion and anonymously um, against other uh, other officers in their department. Um, I will also be including to the Board of Supervisors the emails that we received from the Sonoma Valley Democrats and the others that we've received through this evening, um, as well as the information from those that we've been receiving during this meeting uh, regarding your input about this. Um, is there anybody here on the CAC that wants anything else either um, to acknowledge anything else or to have anything else included uh, on the letter. Um, I'm going to be drafting the letter this evening when we're done um, with uh, Lorena Barrera and uh, we will uh, plan to send it to the Board of Supervisors tonight. I just would like to have just thank everyone, thank all the panelists and our public and everyone for leaning in. I mean, we're four hours in and it's been um, captivating the entire time. And I just appreciate, I'm sad about the stories and um, of course I can um, totally relate. And I just thank everyone for just spending so much time around this subject. We've done a lot in the last few weeks, but I know that doesn't compare to this project that's been going on for years. So just good work. And I just wanna thank everyone for their time and, and thank the CAC members for all of their work and uh, Director Navarro. I wanna- Thank you. Um, and, and I do wanna thank uh, all of our panelists again, those who spoke and those who were present to listen. Uh, we do appreciate you being here uh, and listening. Uh, for the supervisors in attendance, we will uh, be sending an email this evening to you as well as your um, colleagues on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the discussion was uh, very much needed and we did appreciate hearing from our uh, community groups, uh, especially our people of color community groups who we really, um, you're right, we don't hear from enough. We don't hear from enough uh, when it's uh, important, when we need to give recommendations and input. Uh, we need to make the Board of Supervisors understand that uh, our recommendations are coming from our community, including um, all of uh, our communities of color and, and our people of color in Sonoma County. So thank you all very, very much uh, for being here. And uh, yeah, Alma, I see uh, your hand okay. raised. I yeah, yeah, I just uh, wanted to, uh, before we end, I, did, yeah. I wanted to really thank the community members for their input. Um, I think uh, our decisions uh, were molded by, by the community output and input, I'm sorry. And we just want to, as, as far as me, I just want to be, um, to voice what you, what you voice. I want to hear you and I want to be able to, to, um, to do what you want, what the community wants, what the community needs. Thank you to all the, 
all the different organizations and to all the young people that are that that came today and listened. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and um, that we listened to. Um, and thank you for your personal stories too, uh, Julio Torres. Thank you, thank you very much. I think um, um, it's just thank you for for opening up and being able to talk about that because those are the real stories. That that's that's what it, when it comes down to is those stops. When it comes down to is is those situations. Um, you know, and uh, a question for you, will you be emailing us also a copy before you send it to the super board of supervisors or, or you're going, will you be emailing the letter? Um, I, uh, we will be emailing the letter to the entire CAC, uh, once, once we get that out tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I don't think it, it may be too difficult to go back and forth with seven people this evening. Yeah. Um, and we do want to get it out as soon as possible to the Board of Supervisors so they have it for tomorrow's meeting. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to include all the comments that, that we discussed today. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody. I, I know it's uh, four and a half hours in, and I really appreciate everybody sticking around this long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then much. if I just may have one moment, you've done a wonderful job moderating this very difficult uh, situation here and the technical aspects as well. But please, please, I beg of you, it is clearly the consensus of this entire group that, by, without, well, a question, that Evelyn Sheetham initiative needs to be placed on the ballot. And if it's possible for the supervisors to add in the modifications, yes, please do. But if don't let that stop the ballot, um, the, uh, the uh, initiative as is, if that's the best can be done tomorrow. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to conclude the uh, CAC meeting at this time. I appreciate everybody's attendance. Oh, one last thing. I apologize. For those of you who weren't able to make public comment, who we had to cut off, for those of you who have more public comment, please feel free to email your comments. I think comments. I have cut up onions. There's please feel free to email your comments, comments, even though we can't hear from everybody at the length of our meetings, we are considering the um, emailed comments uh, fully. So if you weren't heard, please email us. We do want to hear from you. We never like cutting people off and not letting everybody speak. We just don't have the time um, tonight. Please email your comments and uh, we will see you all hopefully at the next CAC meeting. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.